Hello, and welcome to the Disability Vote Summit. I'm Kurt Decker, Executive Director of the National Disability Rights Network. First, I'd like to thank the American Association of People with Disabilities, the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, and the Democracy Fund. Without their generous support, this summit would not be possible. I'd also like to acknowledge the Rutgers University, Self Advocates Becoming Empowered, and the National Federation of the Blind for joining us today and enriching our program. The goal of this summit is for policymakers to better understand the disability community and the potential impact on elections, especially close elections. To learn that the challenges people with disabilities face when casting a ballot can vary by disability status, socioeconomic factors, and the accessibility of their polling places. And to understand that while people with disabilities are a large voting bloc, they aren't monolithic either. Their political beliefs and priorities vary, though there is a consistent finding that they want leaders who will address the needs of the disability community. And that doesn't happen nearly often enough. In fact, during the Democratic primaries of the last election, it took eight debates before the candidates for president were even asked a question about disability. It continues to be rare for candidates for any office to have sections of their platform devoted to disability policy. Considering that oh, there are over 61 million Americans that have a disability and the federal government oversees billions of dollars in disability-related spending, why don't candidates for offices take voters with disabilities more seriously? That's a question we at NDRN have sought to answer for over the past two years, using polling, interviews, focus groups, and data from the 2020 election, we examined the attitudes, behaviors, and experiences of voters with disabilities. What we found should serve as a wake-up call to anyone running for office. We hope today can be an opportunity for you to learn about this group of voters and what can be done to ensure people with disabilities can enjoy the full promise of civic life and participate fully in our democracy. Thank you for joining the Disability Vote Summit. Now please join me in welcoming our MC, Robin Troutman, the Deputy Director of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. As Kurt mentioned, my name is Robin Troutman, and I am the Deputy Director of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities. I use the pronoun she, her, and I am a woman with uh, d uh, brownish hair, wearing glasses, and wearing a black shirt, sitting in front of a brown chair, and you might see uh, our spare bedroom, but disregard that. Um, I will be your MC for the first part of uh, our very first Disability Vote Summit. Before we get started, I want to go through some instructions for the accommodations and logistics for this webinar. Breaks. You may have noticed that there are not many breaks noted on the agenda, but please be sure to take as many breaks as you need since we will be recording the entire event. We will have multiple American Sign Language interpreters for this webinar, and they should be visible on screen and will switch between each other. We will also have live captioning provided in both English and Spanish. The English captioning is available directly in Zoom by selecting the CC or closed captioning button at the bottom of the Zoom window. In addition, there will be an English stream text link that should be showing up in the chat box now. We also will have Spanish captioning and audio available. To access the Spanish audio, select interpreting at the bottom of your screen and choose to listen to the event in Spanish. To access the Spanish captioning, you will need to click on the Spanish stream text link in which we will also be putting in the chat throughout the event. If you are having any issues accessing the American Sign Language interpreters, captioning, or Spanish interpreting, or any other technical issues, you can message the panelists and the hosts using the chat function. As I noted, we will be recording, so we will share the recording and transcript with you after the summit is over. And don't worry if you missed any part of the summit, you will be able to check that recording. 
In addition, we will have slides and video messages available to all participants after the summit is over, so be on the lookout for that link. If you do have questions, you can use the Q&A box um, ahead of time to, to put those in. And we do, we know we, some of you have um, submitted questions via email and we have those and we're looking forward uh, to sending those to our presenters. As Kurt mentioned, the disability vote is powerful. In 2020, over 38 million voters with disabilities were eligible to vote. However, there is a persistent 7% percentage point gap whew, in turnout between voters with and without disabilities. Today, we will hear from experts in the disability rights field, as well as voting rights and civil and human rights fields as a whole. We have a jam-packed agenda, so let's get started. Our first presentation is from the National Federation of the Blind, discussing their 2020 Blind and Low Vision Voter Survey. Lou Ann Blake is the Director of Research Programs, and Jeff Kalock is the Government Affairs Specialist at the National Federation for the, for the Blind. Lou Ann and Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, and thank you to uh, Jack and Michelle Bishop at NDRN for the invitation to participate in this uh, summit. Uh, my name is Luann Blake. I am Director of Research Programs for the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, my pronoun pronouns are she, her, and I'll try to describe myself. I uh, wear glasses, but I, I am blind. Um, um, I have gray hair, um, pulled back in a French braid. Um, I have a top that has a sort of a light green background and um, bluish and blackish and reddish speckles on it. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Uh, Jeff? And my name is Jeff Kalock. I'm the Government Affairs Specialist at the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I currently am uh, wearing a suit with a uh, purple shirt. Um, and I, I do have glasses on and my, my hair is, is combed back right now. It's brown combed back hair. And we'll get started with the presentation. So um, as, as we mentioned, we're, we, Luann and I are both at the National Federation of the Blind. We're gonna be talking about the Blind and Low Vision Voter Survey. And to start off, we're gonna give you a little bit of a background. Uh, the first survey following the, the, was following the 2008 general election. Uh, we also conducted surveys following the 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018, and 2020 general elections as well. I'll just throw in a little more background about those surveys. Our first survey uh, that we did in 2008 was a, a telephone survey, um, and we used a, a list owned by the National Federation of the Blind of people that had a relationship with the NFB. Uh, since then, um, all of our surveys have been done through SurveyMonkey, and we've promoted those surveys through our members list, um, as well as announcements in our weekly president's notebook. Jeff? And then uh, to go into the 2020 Blind uh, Voter Survey, uh, there were two separate surveys for, this, for, this, for the 2020 general election, uh, one being in-person voters and one being absentee uh, or by mail voters. A uh, total of 524 blind and low vision voters completed the survey. Uh, 333 uh, of those 524 were in person whereas uh, 191 uh, completed uh, by absentee or, or by mail survey. And 64% of the survey participants voted at their polling place as 36% uh, uh, of the surveys or, or of the participants voted absentee. Yeah, and I'll just add real quickly that um, this was the first uh, election year, 2020, that we actually did uh, a survey of blind voters who voted absentee or by mail. A um, couple of reasons for that. Um, because of COVID, of course, uh, many elections were changed to primarily vote by mail. Um, and the, just the trend um, of voting by mail has become more popular over the years. So we kind of wanted to you know, get an idea of uh, you know, the participation of, of blind voters as absentee voters. Jeff? 
then the results of the 2020 in-person blind voters survey, um, uh, were you offered or did you request an accessible voting machine? In 2020, 92% answered yes. Uh, the highest value was 92% in 2020 and in 2016 as well. And the lowest value of this, this number was 63% in 2008. And I would say that this is really the only parameter of all the parameters that we survey where we've actually seen some improvement, <laughs> uh, sadly to say. Uh, you know, we, we have seen um, a fairly good uh, percentage of in 2020 uh, and, and previously uh, where vote, blind voters were actually offered or requested use of the accessible ballot marking device. And, and further results of that 2020 in-person uh, survey was, was the accessible ballot marking device up and running when you arrived at the polls? And in 2020, 68% answered yes. This is only a slight improvement from the 66% reported in 2016 and the 20, 2018 surveys. Uh, the highest value we received was 87% in 2008 for ballot marking devices that were up and running and the lowest was 63% that we uh, in, you know, endured in 2012. Yeah, so, so this data shows, I think, what we all know anecdotally, um, and that uh, poll worker training, um, when it comes to setting up and operating the accessible ballot marking device, is, is lacking. Um, consistently, over our surveys, about one third of the survey participants have said that the machine was not up and running when they arrived at the polling place. Uh, so that means that they had to wait, you know, for the poll workers to set it up. Uh, frequently, the machine was not set up because the poll workers didn't know how to set it up. Um, so, you know, so this means that uh, poll worker or the voter has to wait around um, and frequently many of those voters end up voting with assistance. Jeff? Yeah, and then uh, the next question, did poll, did poll workers have problems setting up or activating the accessible uh, voting machines? And 24% answered yes in 2020. Uh, the highest percentage that responded yes was 33% in 2018, 2016, and 2012. Uh, the lowest percent was 19% in 2008. Yeah, so here we, show, here we see um, that yes, uh, you know, about a third of um, voters encounter um, the, the machines not being set up. So, so yeah, so it is a problem. It has consi consistently been a problem. Um, and, um, you know, uh, throughout our surveys that we've taken over the years. And um, so this is a problem that uh, we continue to, to work on and, and uh, need to address with the elections officials. The next question was, were you able to vote privately and independently using an accessible voting machine? 77% said yes in 2020. This is the, the highest reported value was 86% in 2008 and 85% in 2016. The lowest value was 75% in 2012 and in 2018. Yeah, so this number is um, a number that we, we can't accept. You know, if, uh, if only 77% of our blind voters are able to vote privately and independently. Um, and so, you know, we need to think about why is that or take a look at why is that. Um, there are a number of reasons why this number is, is 77%. Um, First of all, of course, you know, we have the issue with machines not being set up, uh, poll workers not knowing how to set up the machines or operating machines. Um, we also have um, some evidence from our surveys that blind voters, not all blind voters are actually know what accessibility features these machines have. So, um, for example, uh, we'll see reference of low vision voters using a handheld magnifier to look at the touch screen uh, rather than increasing the, the font size on the machine itself. Um, also, um, 
um, we've seen some evidence over the last few election cycles of blind voters just really getting frustrated with the experience of using the accessible ballot marking device. Um, you know, when you're using, particularly when you're using the audio ballot, um, it takes a long time to go through the ballot, um, especially when there's a number of ballot measures. Um, and if you're forced to read through the entire ballot measure before you can actually um, choose how you um, want to vote on that ballot measure. Um, so, so we see some evidence that there are some blind voters who are just opting out of voting with assistance or, or opting to vote with assistance rather than using the accessible ballot marking device. Um, so, you know, all those factors contribute you know, to only, you know, about 77% um, uh, being able, be, being able to vote privately and independently using an accessible ballot marking device. Okay, Jeff. And, and the, the percentage of blind and low vision voters who voted at the polls with assistance was 25% in 2020, 29% in 2018, 17% in 2016, 21% in 2014, 32% in 2012, and 37% in 2008. Yeah, so here we did see a little bit of improvement, you know, in the number of um, voters, blind voters who were voting with assistance, um, uh, going down, you know, slightly from 2008 to 2014. Um, and then um, also 2016, but then around 2016, we've started to increase again. Um, you know, 2016, we're at 17%, and then um, 2018, we're at 29%, and 2020, we're at 25%. So, you know, it looks like we're doing a little backsliding here, which, um, you know, is concerning. And I think kind of coincides with the frustration that, that we've seen in the data over the last couple of election cycles of um, the blind voters are experiencing um, when using accessible ballot marking devices. Um, you know, um, you know, voters may start off with the voting on the ballot marking device, but then, you know, they encounter some kind of a problem. There's a problem with the machine. Um, and the poll workers don't really know how to troubleshoot the problem. And so then they end up voting with assistance. So, um, so I think the, this slide and the previous slide shows that, shows that um, issue. And then the methods used to mark uh, absentee ballots, 37% uh, marked paper ballots with assistance. 35% use an accessible electronic ballot delivery system to privately and independently mark their ballot. 20% independently hand marked a paper ballot and 8% use a braille ballot or plastic template. Yeah, so uh, electronic ballot delivery systems are relatively new. Um, uh, some of you may not be aware of what they are. Um, typically, it's um, a web a web page um, that contains the va the ballot. Um, you get emailed a link from your elections office, um, and this enables the voter to access the ballot using their own PC. Uh, and their own access technology. And these systems are designed to comply with the web content accessibility guidelines. So that means that whatever access technology you use um, will work with these systems. So, you know, a, a screen reader, screen magnification, refreshable braille display, um, voice, you know, speaking, uh, any of those things will work with these systems. Um, there are also um, are another type of system where it's a, an HTML um, ballot that gets emailed to you. Um, so those are the type of systems um, that are uh, electronic ballot delivery systems. Um, so it's interesting to see um, that even though these systems have not been, well, in some states they've been used, used for a while, but uh, for 2020, uh, there was about, uh, about half the states um, provided these systems. And so we see that um, uh, about 35% use these type of systems um, when they voted absentee. The reasons for choosing to use electronic ballot delivery system 
uh, are, are typically uh, to avoid the risk of ex exposure to COVID-19 at the polling place, which was 42% of the people surveyed. Um, uh, paper ballot is inaccessible to me, was at 40%. Uh, I simply just wanted to try. It was at 24% uh, and uh, I voted in an all vote by mail state, which was 6%. Right, yeah, so this is kind of what we were expecting um, because of COVID, uh, voters didn't want to risk exposure by going to their polling place, so they were looking to vote absentee. Um, so that was the, um, the primary reason that was, was given by these voters who use the electronic ballot delivery system. The reasons for choosing a traditional paper ballot uh, the, the top choice was to avoid exposure to COVID-19 at the polls, which was at 49%. Uh, and at 28% was I used a paper ballot for previous elections, so they're, they're accustomed to it. And then 18% um, is there is not an accessible way to vote absentee in my state. Yeah, so uh, again, only about half the states in 2020 provide an accessible way to vote absentee. And in many of those states, uh, 2020 was the first election uh, election year, uh, and in many cases, the general election was the very first election that they provided access to such a system. Uh, so a lot of people, you know, uh, weren't aware that there was an accessible way to vote absentee. Um, and so, you know, some people continued to vote uh, using a paper ballot because they had used that before, um, that system before. Um, and again, here we see that COVID, you know, avoiding risk, risk to um, exposure to COVID was the primary reason for, for using a paper ballot to vote absentee. And then uh, access technology used to mark absentee ballots or, or vote by mail ballots. Uh, screen reader was at 35%. CCTV was at 7%, uh, screen magnification was at 5%, uh, refreshable braille display was at 3%, and uh, other technology, handheld magnifier, or smartphone magnifier app was at 13%, and did not use access technology to mark a ballot was at 48%. Yeah, so here we're illustrating that, um, especially when you use electronic ballot delivery, any kind of a uh, technology works with those systems um, but then you know, also you know have the low vision folks who are using um, their handheld magnifier um, to complete uh, or a CCTV to mark their ballot so all types of technology are being used to uh, to uh, mark an absentee ballot then 85 percent of the survey respondents who use an electronic ballot delivery system said they found it easy to use 7% said they had encountered problems with printing the ballot or that printing the ballot was difficult. Yeah, and so printing the ballot, which is required uh, currently by the majority of the states that provide electronic ballot delivery. So an accessible way to mark a ballot, but they do require that the ballot be printed out. And that fact is preventing a lot of uh, blind voters actually from using these systems. Um, many blind voters actually don't have printers. Um, so uh, if they wanna use an electronic ballot delivery system, they can mark it on their computer, but then they have to you know, download the ballot onto a thumb drive and you know, find a, uh, a computer that has their access, access technology that is connected to a printer and print the ballot out. So, uh, so while the marking of the ballot is you know, very easy, um, the delivery of the ballot, the return of the ballot is, is remains to be a problem. Um, particularly, you know, when you have to uh, print the ballot out, uh, sign an envelope, you know, that uh, there is no accessible way to um, figure out where to sign the ballot, although there are some ways that that can be uh, made accessible. Um, but the return of the ballot continues to be a problem. Presentation. Yes, that's it. So uh, any questions we'll be happy to take. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Lou Ann. There are um, a couple of questions. One was, uh, where can we find this data and is there a county breakdown? 
So the only um, demographic data that we took was we did ask the voters which state they voted in. So we do have data broken down that way. Um, and the report um, is found on our website. Um, so if you go to nfb.org slash vote, um, there will be a link um, on that page to our HAVA web pages where all of our reports from all of our surveys um, can be found. And I can provide that um, report also if you want to um, email me. I'd be happy to, to send it to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Another question um, from Jenny is uh, she is trying to learn about resources for persons with disabilities in her, in her community. Is there somewhere to view a video of the voting device that you described earlier? And that way she could describe it to those who would like that information. Well, actually, um, right now we are working on putting together videos of the ballot marking devices. Uh, right now we, we're working on four. So four of the most commonly found ballot marking devices that you'll find in polling places. Um, and these videos will highlight the accessibility features of the ballot marking devices. And, um, and then we also will um, work through the demo ballot that's on these ballot marking devices. So you can see actually, and here actually, because it's the audio ballot that we're demoing, um, as, but as well as uh, screen magnification um, features and contrast features we're demoing. Um, so you'll be able to um, see how, how you actually go through a ballot and mark the ballot using those um, accessibility features. Great, and uh, Lou Ann, will you be able to share those videos um, or links with us so we can send it out to everyone? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, so we'll have those links on our HAVA webpage. Um, we'll also be providing those um, links to uh, NDRN so they can um, provide those links as well. Wonderful. Um, we have another question from uh, Susan. How does the electronic ballot delivery system comply with election security requirements? Uh, well, so there are some NIST standards or well, guidelines, I guess you could say. Um, there also are some more general security standards. Um, one of the systems, the Democracy Live system, which is probably the most widely used electronic ballot delivery system, uh, is on an Amazon cloud server. Um, that server has been certified by Department of Homeland Security, um, you know, many other federal agencies as being secure. Um, and currently, um, the um, uh, there's a uh, institute on uh, security and, and politics uh, at uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, that has put together a, a working group to come up with security guidelines. Um, and you know, not to mention that these these systems, when they are in use, are constantly monitored. Um, so uh, you know, so there's. Uh, has not been any security breaches of, of these systems uh, to date, <laughs> I should say. And you know, some of these systems have been in use uh, for quite a while. Uh, so, uh, so I think you know uh, we can be pretty feel pretty safe using these systems. But you know, there's continuing to be work um, to make them even more secure. So, great. Um, Another question we have is from uh, Garrett, and it says, do you by chance know or maybe have an idea of the increase in 2018? Sorry. Sure, we might want, yeah. Garrett, if you could put a little bit more information in that, that would be helpful. Um, another question from uh, Reginald, how many states allow an electronic signature and do you, where can we find the list of those states? Um, there are a few states, I don't know if you're referring to electronic ballot delivery in return. Um, there are a few states that do permit electronic return. Um, I think that's five or six states. Um, and so some kind of an electronic signature is acceptable in those states. And um, I think that it's Nevada, 
Massachusetts, uh, West Virginia, uh, North Jeff Carolina. helped me. I'm North sorry? Carolina. North yeah, Carolina. and Hawaii, and Hawaii. And Colorado, so those are the, Colorado, passed. that's right. Yep. So those are the six states that currently permit electronic return. Great, thank you. And then oh, uh, with uh, Garrett's question, it was the sudden increase in people with disabilities voting since 2018. Well, I think someone else is going to have to answer because our survey just focused on blind voters. And so we don't really uh, look at the overall percentage year to year. So um, I think someone else could probably answer that question. Better. Yeah, we'll probably get to some of that later on in the session also. So we'll definitely be sure to to come back to that question. So thank you. And then um, we do have one additional question. Um, is there updated assistance accessible technology available to states that want to use this technology? Um, uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. If you're referring to an electronic ballot delivery and return system or electronic ballot delivery system, so the technology that the voter uses is their own access technology, whether it be at their home, on their home computer, their office computer, uh, maybe a computer at a library, you know, that has a screen reader on it. Um, so it's, it's not up to the, the jurisdiction to provide the access technology. It's the voter that supplies the access technology on whatever computer is they're using. Great. And then we actually do have another question from Olivia. Olivia would like to know why all of our focus is not put on making mail-in voting the safest and most accessible way to vote. And why aren't we providing printers like we have provided other needed equipment in order to support independence? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the trend is moving more towards mailing voting. Um, it has been for a number of years. Um, you know, more states are looking to move to all mail voting. Um, and you know, if we uh, if states would adopt electronic return, then there's no need to print out the ballot. You just automatically. Uh, well, you either download the ballot um, and then email it as an attachment to your um, jurisdiction, to your elections office. Uh, the Democracy Live system, uh, the electronic return works there um, by actually just simply moving the ballot. Once the ballot has been marked uh, by the voter, it just moves from an, to a different section of the uh, cloud server and the election office gets a notification that there is a um, marked ballot ready to be downloaded. And then they just download the ballot and print it out at the elections office. Um, so, so there's always a ballot that gets printed out um, with these systems. Um, either it's the voter that prints out the ballot or it's the elections office that prints out the ballot. And it's important to note um, that the, uh, thought to add any detail into that too. Um, in addition to providing printers, as you have mentioned, it's, it's also very difficult for, for a blind and print, print disabled um, voter to uh, sign, sign the form and send it back, as well as ensure and verify that the votes that, they, that the ballot that they had uh, marked is correct. Um, so that's another reason why it's important, as Luann mentioned, for, for electronic ballot delivery and return. Yeah, some jurisdictions have very strict um signing uh, requirements, you know, if it's not signed exactly on the line, uh, then, you know, they, uh, they, they challenge that signature. Um, so while some states like Colorado say, well, all you have to do is sign on the bottom half of the, of the signature page, you know, so there's, there are ways that it can be handled, but, um, you know, uh, requiring that the ballot be printed out, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just a lot easier, a lot more convenient for the voter just to return it electronically. Um, kind of a follow-up to that, and it says uh, from Lynn, since the electronic return of a ballot breaks the secrecy of the vote, is there a way for a voter to get confirmation that the elections office has received and printed or transferred votes to a paper ballot correctly? Yeah, so um, 
So I, I use the system here in Maryland. Um, I've used that system ever since it's been available. Um, and so I do get um, an email uh, from the elections office when they receive my ballot. And then I can, I also, I think if I remember right, in 2020, I also received an email or a text, it, it could be a text too, um, that the ballot's been counted. Um, so, so there are, you know, jurisdictions that are doing that. Um, there's also um, some electronic ballot delivery um, uh, vendors, um, enhanced voting being one of those, um, that, you know, it's an electronic ballot delivery system currently, but they're looking to incorporate return uh, to their system and they're going to, and they're incorporating end to end verification as part of that electronic return. So what that means is that at every step of the process, um, there's a ver verification that occurs um, that, uh, you know, that uh, yes, the ballot is received, yes, it's been um, counted, or yes, the votes have been transferred, and then yes, it's been counted, and, and the voter gets a code um, so that you can go and um, go to a website and, and confirm um, that the ballot has moved through every step of the process. So, so that is being... Um, being incorporated in some of these systems. Wonderful. And then our final question, which uh, a few people have asked in, in various formats, so I'm going to go ahead and try to um, combine them all into one, is um, as we know, there are a number of, of uh, laws that have been passed throughout the states um, that will uh, potentially suppress the vote for people with disabilities. Um, how is the low vision blind community uh, planning to respond to those uh, voter suppression laws nationally and statewide? And what can individuals voters do um, to um, advocate against those bills mm -hmm. or laws? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Jeff and I um, co-authored a resolution um, condemning and deploring voter suppression laws. That resolution was just adopted uh, this past July at our national convention. Uh, so that's one thing that we've done on a national level. Um, and then we also work with our affiliates um, to um, support them in, in their efforts to um, uh, advocate against these types of, of laws. So, um, so we're, we're working both on the national level and the state level um, against these laws. Great. Um, so that, um, oh, wait, we have one more. Um, nope, that's for everyone. We'll put that in the in the chat box, actually. But thank you so much, Lou Ann and Jeff, for your presentation and the important work you are doing on advocating for people who are blind or have low vision, especially in the voting rights space. Um, our next presentation, uh, we're going to quickly move forward. If this is a good time to take a quick break as we um, get everyone set up. But our next presentation is called The Power of the Disability Vote, and we will hear from Diana Mayrose of the Hamilton County Developmental Disability Services and Essie Peterson from Self Advocates Becoming Empowered, also known as SAVE, their Go Voter Project. Diana and Essie, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good to start, Diana. Okay. Hello, and thank you for having us at the 2021 Vote Data Summit. My name is Diana Myros, and I wear many hats. And one of them is the same Region 5 board member. And I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I have reddish brown hair, glasses, and a red polo shirt that says, I shave every time I vote. And I go by she and her. Hi, this is Essie Peterson, and I will be talking with you a little bit later. 
but I also am in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I am a staff member to Self Advocates Becoming Empowered, the Go Voter Project. I am, uh, I have uh, ear length white hair. I'm wearing red glasses and a red shirt. And like uh, Diana, I am wearing the, our Go Voter shirt, which is I make history every time I vote. I also go by the pronouns of she, her, and uh, look forward to talking with you. Next yeah. slide. Good. Our agenda today is to talk about, number one is to talk about the expertise and goals of the Safe Photo, Pro Photo Project. Number two, to discuss the two major activities of the project, which are the powerful toolkit, distance training, and the same photo experience survey. Next slide, please. The purpose of the same photo project. Number one is to educate people with disabilities about the voting rights and responsibilities by free safe pro voter toolkit distance training webinars. Number two is to provide technical assistance to improve voting experiences with our survey findings. Number three is to support the partnerships of PNAs and self advocacy groups by providing training and technical assistance. Next slide, please. The goals of the Safe Pro Voter Project. Number one to make sure voters with developmental disabilities feel ready to vote. Number two is to make free teaching tools available that are easy to understand and use. Number three is to work together to educate voters with DD and their allies to train voters. Number four is to learn by people with DD who do not vote. Yeah, number five, we also ask people with DD, developmental disabilities, who do vote what works and what does not work well when they vote. Number six, our goal is to boost the numbers of voters with developmental disabilities. Next slide, please. Voting, it's your right. Why to vote? It's my right. It's my duty, it's my voice, because I can. Why not to vote? No excuses there. Next slide, please. The Save Pro Voter Toolkit Training. Since 2014, 20 states have been trained on the whole voter toolkit. To participate in this training, PNAs and self advocacy groups must submit a joint letter. Number 
Three is to be the maximum of five states that are selected for training at any one time. Next slide, please. Training structure requirements. Number one is to include a self-advocacy organization. And number two is to have one protection and act. Protection and advocacy. They must train and present together. We also have evaluations from participants at the state at the state training, from state team about training by code photo. Each advocacy group that completes this will receive $500. Next slide, please. The same code photo distance training. The states must complete number one. Three webinars to learn how to use the Roboto toolkit. Activity in the toolkit increase photo confidence. Number two is to teach a minimum of one straight state training. Number three is one evaluation webinar after state trainings are completed. Next slide, please. Um, I'll take over we'll, from here. Yeah. Um, Diana, thank you so much. Uh, we have a quick video here that was developed by people with DD. Uh, on ways to recruit voters to complete the SAVCO voter survey. But in the interest of time, we're going to hold on that. And if we have time later, we will show it again. Next slide, please. I uh, am pleased to say that this is the cover of the upcoming SAVCO voter experience survey results, the power of the disability vote. And this is a review of the 2020 election. Uh, we hope that this report, report, the way it is written, will be helpful to uh, researchers because we have taken our research and placed it into plain language. And because of that, it's it's been a challenge. It's the first time we've taken research and done it this way. and. Uh, we, we think that it's we're going to be able to interpret it pretty well. Next slide, please. Why does SAVE do the Go Voter Experience Survey every two years? Uh, we started doing this survey in 2012, and it has just grown and evolved over the years. Uh, the reasons why we have questions, and everything that SAVE does starts with questions. Do voters with one kind of disability have a better voting experience? If they do, why do they? Do voters from one disability group vote more often? And if so, why? Do voters know how to use the voting equipment? How many first time voters? How was it for them? Was the poll worker, ways that the poll worker did or did not support voters? Why did voters choose a particular way to vote? Ways guardians did or did not help voters? And did COVID-19 change the way people voted? Next slide. We've taken that information that we have collected from the reports and the report itself is divided into nine sections. We focus on the survey, the voter experience survey. We talk about polling center accessibility, how voters with DD actually did vote for 2020, the voting equipment and the ballots, first time voters. We look at poll workers, 
We look closely at voter education and ways, ways to reach voters to get information to them, guardianship, and uh, the impact of COVID-19. Next slide, please. We were able to collect 1,280 surveys from 47 states. I, we were a little bit discouraged with our number, but Michelle Bishop from NDRN said to me, you know, that's a really big number considering it's COVID and we can't reach people to complete the survey. So when I changed my way of thinking about it, yeah, we are pretty happy with the fact that we got that number. The majority of the surveys did come from four states, uh, North Carolina, 235 surveys, Ohio, 126, New York, 97, and Wisconsin, 86. Uh, our goal with the survey was that we wanted to have 100 surveys from every state. So we're still challenged by that goal, and we hope that we'll be able to get there by the next time we do this report. Next slide. When we look at the report, we're able to take this information and describe the voter in a number of different ways. We can look at age, we can look at their gender, we can look at the voter as to where they are working or not working, the type of disability, where voters live, race, and the state that they live in. All of this information we are able to pull from our survey and uh, it is available when you get the full document later. Next slide, please. Because we have so much information in the report itself, and we have so many different ways that we can look at the data, we had a challenge to decide what we were going to share with you today. So we narrowed it down and we decided that we would talk about the African-American voter to learn, uh, to share with you what we learned from the survey about them. We asked the question, how often do you vote? And four out of 10 African-American voters said they have never voted. When we look at all of the surveys uh, that were completed, the numbers were two out of 10 of all voters who completed the survey <clears throat> said that they had never voted. That's a 22% difference between those two groups. We've got a long way to go. Next slide. The largest number of first time voters are African American and Asian. So with the African-American voters that we're reaching, we're getting those first time voters. So we are starting to get people to vote within the group. We're looking at ways that we have been successful or at reaching these voters and looking at uh, continuing the things that we have learned. Next slide. Now, why voters did not vote? Seven out of 10 African-American voters were told they could not vote. Five out of 10 of all the voters who completed the survey were told they could not vote. This should be zero, totally. This is a very high number of people being told they cannot vote for a variety of reasons, which you can read our report and we'll be happy to share that with you. But this is a sad number. Next slide, please. Our data shows only three out of 10 African-American voters use the internet to get information. And when we talk about the internet, we're talking about the, the computer technology itself, as well as, as access to the internet. Only five out of 10 of all the voters surveyed use the internet to get information. We found that Collecting this type of information is important because part of our problem is we're not able to reach certain groups of people and uh, we need to get very creative as to how we're going to be going about that. So next slide, please. Why voters did not vote. Two out of 10 African-American voters said because they were told 
uh, because they do not know how to vote. Two out of 10 of all voters surveyed said they do not know how to vote. That's why we spend so much time on voter education and we wanted to let you know that we do have a program that Diana went through that was written by and for people with uh, developmental disabilities. And we are trying to get that out there more and more. Next slide, please. This slide is a, a summary sheet that we think facilitates discussions. And you can use this within your state. It focuses on the African-American voter and it is designed with eight colorful blocks with information in each one. And certain slides also include the stick people that are there. And we start off with a, uh, a young woman, Lynn Karras, who says, I vote because it's important to get the right person to help people with disabilities get the services they need. There's a real desire people with DD want to vote. And one out of 10 of all the surveys that we were looking at were completed by African-American voters. Four out of 10 voters said they did not vote in the 2020 election, and we discussed that. And the largest number of first-time voters are African-American. Seven out of 10 voters were told they could not vote. Two out of 10 voters do not know how to vote. Only three of 10 voters use the internet, and then we have contact information. If you have questions about the training, uh, there's an email address to go to. And then if your question's about the survey, <clears throat> someone that you could contact, our email, our, our website address is govoter.org. <clears throat> You'll be able to see all of this. One of the ways that we see reaching more and more voters is by providing worksheets like this or sheets with this kind of information so that coalitions, uh, work groups within states can look at these numbers and say, okay, what are we gonna do about it in the state of Ohio? Because I'll just pick us because we're here. So hopefully you'll be able to use that. Next slide. A question for you. Do you know our national, state and county election officials and policymakers asking voters with DD to help them plan and operate elections. Why or why not? This is your job to find out to make sure that the changes that we have in this report and suggested improvements are reaching the people that it needs to reach. Uh, next slide, please. Before we go into the Q&A, which is right now. So Robin, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, um, Essie and Diana. So um, we have two questions that are um, asking about uh, survey results from specific states, uh, specifically Kentucky and Texas, but this survey is sent to all states nationally, is that correct? So it's That's not correct. just, okay. So. Um, how, when, you know, when the survey does go out, you know, what is the best way for people um, to access the survey? I know NACDD sent it out um, to their lists, and I know a number of, I know um, NDRN and um, all the other participants on this call, AAPD, um, but, you know, to be sure that we get results from states like Kentucky and Texas, what do you recommend? Uh, we as uh, Robin just shared, we do use a lot of the national and state organizations to disseminate the survey. We also recommend some ways they could collect the data. And also we connect with the self-advocacy groups in that state to uh, help find individuals to complete the survey. This survey is written in easy to use and understand language but it is a challenge for individuals who do not read or do not write. And so there's support that's needed to, to reach these folks. Uh, in years past, we've gone to the self-advocacy groups and we have completed the survey there with individuals. And that actually has proven to be the, the best way to go. And this year, because of COVID, 
a lot of the work was done on the telephone. Individuals were contacted by phone. Uh, if it was a trusted person they felt comfortable with, they completed the survey with them and then it was uh, provided to us. So there's lots of ways that it goes out. And if you have any questions directly within your state, go to your PNA. Your PNA is going to be uh, the best informed as to the status of the survey in their state. And you had a question about Kentucky and Texas. Uh, and Georgia. Uh, and, and Georgia. Well, Kentucky, there, you had one survey. Uh, Texas, I know, is not very good either. Uh, they had zero for 2020. And in 2018, you had one. Now, Georgia is a great state. Uh, Georgia, uh, this year had uh, 16 surveys that were completed. Uh, and last year they had 31. And that's just an example of how COVID has really made it harder and harder for us to reach folks. Wonderful. Um, one question is, um, they said they're sorry if they missed the qualification earlier, but the statistics you shared of African American voters not voting or being told they cannot vote, is that based on all African American voters or is that a subset of disabled African American voters? Based on the African American voters who completed our survey of uh, uh, of individuals with developmental disabilities. It's not representative of all African-American voters. This is a targeted population that uh, the information is used to facilitate reaching people and looking at the needs that they've identified they want to have targeted. Great. Um, we've had a number of people ask where they can get a copy of the 2020 survey report. Well, I'm very happy to say that uh, it was to be available today, which we were thrilled about. But because of me, uh, I'm going through the last time to make sure it's totally accessible. And uh, actually, it'll be done by tomorrow. And it will be posted on the GoVoter.org website, <clears throat> excuse me, by Friday. So please go to GoVoter.org by Friday, and it will be on our website. Uh, wonderful. Um, and then back to the question on the African American voters turning away. Um, were there reasons given as to why they were told they cannot vote? Um, or, you know, what, who were the organizations or who exactly was telling them that they were not able to vote, uh, able to vote? I don't have the specific information of who told them they could not vote. They had an option to uh, select that the reason they did not vote is because they were told they could not vote. Or the reason they did not vote was because they do not know how to vote. So it was a series of options that the individual chose from. And I think that as we're, we're learning more and more, some of these groups, are, we should be going in and looking more in depth. Uh, that is, that's very important. And then one person said, it's not a question, but a comment. And it says, every time we have a discussion about voting in Alaska, they always provide time for people that are interested in voting, get that opportunity because they understand the importance of voting. So they're, so, you know, that this person is interested in seeing what others, how other states handle this. Um, so I think that report will be very helpful um, to, to all states. Um, is there a way to figure out how other minorities with DD voted um, and what barriers there were and why? Uh, yes, uh, the numbers of folks who completed the survey, we have uh, the Hispanic Latino uh, population, we have the Asian, we have the indigenous peoples, we've got the Hawaiian and um, with the Native American. So we have all of those groups that have completed the survey, but the numbers are very small. So, but we've just, we've, we're starting and we're starting to find them. 
that's why some of these states would be so helpful to uh, gather this information. So we encourage everyone to, to help us out when you can. Diana, you're muted. I just want to say that some of the geographical questions on the survey are optional or sometimes are not answered. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Everyone has the option not to answer the questions. They have the option not to complete the survey as well. And the survey was uh, provided in English and Spanish. So uh, we're really trying to reach more and more. Um, and then just to confirm, Essie and Diana, this survey you only do every four years or do you do it at the midterms as well? Every two years. Every two years. So we should be expecting one after the 2022 midterm elections. Yes, you will. So please, um, everyone, now that you're here, please, if you you know think about it, that maybe like December, January, between 2022, 2023, um, to think about that this survey is going to come out. And if you haven't seen it yet, to check the govoter.org website or any of your disability organizations within your state um, to make sure that you receive a copy. Um, our last uh, question or comment is, and this is a really important one, whether it's answered by you, Essie and Diana, or any of our uh, panelists and presenters later on throughout the day, but how can we increase the diversity of voting more nationally? That, that is a challenge. And that's a challenge that SAVE is working on. Uh, for us reaching uh, diversity, we work a lot with state self-advocacy groups. Many of those are not very diverse. Some of them are very diverse. I don't want to you know, put them in little silos like that. But we are challenged with that as well. What we want to see happen and we're trying to do is that this report is written in plain language. There is a plain language summary of the, the chapter that discusses poll workers or whatever a section it is. And then we have recommended actions that you can take. And it's within those action steps that you might look at to see if they will help you reach more and more diverse populations. Diana? You're me. I, I also want to say that there are different types of diversity, um, not just disability, but race. And um, it is becoming a hot topic more and more um and it's been not just locally on local levels but on state levels as well so i'm really hoping that we can use that outlet and get more voting and more people to vote yeah, I just like to make a, a summary statement here. You know, everybody was concerned how COVID was going to affect the election. It did affect the election. Uh, voters who have developmental disabilities like to vote at the polling location. They like to physically be present. They like to feel that inclusive environment when they vote. This year, uh, or in 2020, Six, over 60% of the people who completed the survey use the mail-in or absentee option. And then we have 30% that voted early, and then we had 20% uh, who, who went to the uh, polling place on election day. So there's lots within this, the survey itself. Uh, we, we try to hit the highlights of things that people would be interested in, but send us questions and we can see if we can pull out specific questions that you might have. However, it will be difficult to do it by states if you only have one, five, 20 surveys. You're not gonna get much information from that. But the states who have close to 100, 
you can see some, some trends or something that jumps out at you that you could use. So please complete the survey when it comes out. It's a valuable resource for everyone, especially with the uh, policy makers and election officials. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much um, to Diana and, and to Essie. Um, and we definitely will be looking out for the next survey after the next election. Um, and just a reminder also, it is National Disability Voter Registration Week. So please be sure that if you aren't registered to get registered, if you have friends and family or colleagues or, or acquaintances that aren't registered, please, please go get registered now um, and, and, and be ready for uh, the midterms or even for November. Um, there are some elections that are happening um, and all elections matter, all voters matter, so please uh, be sure to get registered. Um, we are now going to take a very short break. Uh, during the break, there will be two video messages. One will be from Mr. Donald Palmer, who is the chairman of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, and the second will be from Rebecca Copley, who is, works in the president's office at the Ford Foundation. We will start our programming again at 1.15 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so please enjoy the videos, take a quick break, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Hi, I'm United States Election Assistance Commission Chairman Don Palmer. Thank you for inviting me to this important Disability Vote Summit and for giving me the opportunity to talk about critical accessibility programs and initiatives at the EAC, the Election Assistance Commission. I'd like to highlight the value of the National Disability Voter Registration Week and today's summit as these, challenge, these efforts are op opportunities to share information, have discussions with each other, ta tackle some of the challenges that uh, we face and empower the millions of voters with disabilities across the country. Uh, the Help America Vote Act, HAVA, which created the EAC, established a clear mandate to ensure that Americans with disabilities be given the full and equal opportunity to vote independently and privately. Uh, providing resources to state and local election officials uh, to help them serve voters with disabilities is truly a core part of our mission. And despite the extraordinary circumstances of the 2020 election, Officials were able to make it one of the most accessible elections to date. Approximately 17.7 million voters with disabilities cast a ballot in the 2020 general election. And this is a significant increase compared to 2016. Research has shown progress, like the narrowing gap for voters with disabilities, but there are still improvements to make. And this demographic will continue to grow, no doubt in turn making it even more critical for election officials at the state and local level to understand the unique challenges that voters with disabilities face. So we are invested in this work and we are committed to ensuring election officials have those resources needed to better serve the disability community. Some examples, the EAC is developing some new tools, resource and best practices to help state and local officials address accessibility concerns throughout the election process, from voter registration through casting an independent and private ballot. For those of you who may not be aware, we commissioned Rutgers University to perform an accessibility study on the 2020 election. We've also hired a full-time accessibility attorney to lead a working group to ensure that accessibility is a priority and permeates throughout the EAC. The EAC will be releasing another study, some findings regarding the digital divide among those with disabilities in several months, and we all look forward to that. Across the country, organizations like AAPD and NDRN and others joining the summit today are doing innovative work in helping election officials understand the needs of voters with disabilities as elections continue to evolve. The EAC is dedicated to serving the accessibility community and assisting election officials as they implement best practices. We wanna be a partner with you on these. If there's anything specific that the EAC can assist you with, please do not hesitate to contact me or our staff 
and we hope to work with you. Thank you for giving me the time to talk to you today and good luck with your summit in the coming days. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Rebecca Coakley, Program Officer for the U.S. Disability Rights Portfolio in the Office of the President at the Ford Foundation. Congratulations to AAPD and NDRN for the 2021 Disability Vote Summit. There are over 38 million voters with disabilities, and our numbers will continue to grow each year. But unfortunately, as you will continue to learn through the summit, there is a persistent turnout gap between voters with and without disabilities. Engaging our community in the democratic process is a key part of advocacy against the ableism and the inequity that our community continues to face. But our community is strong, and we showed that in 2020 and every day since that disability policy issues are not fringe priorities, that we are the base of our democracy. Creating an equitable country for people with disabilities in which we have equal opportunity to live, work, thrive, and love starts with our vote. While we're talking about voting, what we're really talking about is our right to have a say in the people and the policies that shape our lives. The work of advocates like so many of you in the audience today is critical to eliminating that gap, getting out the disability vote, and making sure that our community has access to the ballot, to the polls, and to our democracy. Lead on. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We're, we hope you uh, got a few moments to take care of some things and see these great messages from um, Donald Palmer and Rebecca Coakley. Uh, we are now excited for our first panel on voting and accessibility. Uh, Sarah Blahovic from the National Council on Independent Living will be our moderator, and I will kick it off to her. Sarah? Thank you, Robin, and happy National Disability Voter Registration Week to everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Blahovic. My pronouns are she and her. I am a white woman with um, glasses and brown hair pulled back in a ponytail. I'm wearing a blue shirt, and I am sitting in my dining room. Um, so there is a table behind me. Um, we're going to start off. Uh, we have some really great panelists, um, so I would love to allow each of them to briefly introduce themselves. If you can um, share who you are, um, give a brief image description of yourself um, and, and what you do. Um, so we'll start with uh, Kristan. Hello, my name is Kristan Pompries and I work for CSE, Communication Services for the Deaf and um, I work with UFC, which is Unite Community Foundation, is where I provide service. And we have an organization called Sign Note, Sign Vote. The initiative is under CSC, and I'm the community engagement manager. And I'm sorry, I did forget to give my visual description first. I am a brown man. I have a salt and pepper beard. I'm wearing a navy blue button up shirt with um, dotted print. I have, I'm happy to be involved in this panel. Thank you. Great. Um, Terry? Hi, I am Terry Almanis. I'm Senior Director of Census and Voting Programs at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC. I am an Asian American female um, and I have long dark hair and I am sitting in front of a not so exciting background with my organization's logo, uh, Asian American Advancing Justice AJC. We are a national nonprofit, um, nonpartisan organization that is dedicated to uh, advancing and protecting the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and building a fair and equitable society for all. And I am super excited to be here with you all today. Great, and Ben. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Jackson. I'm a black man wearing glasses, uh, white button down with a pink tie and a gray suit jacket. My background is blurred. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I was the attorney that was mentioned in Chairman Palmer's uh, 
address that we just heard. Uh, I am a new uh, subject matter expert to the Election Assistance Commission um, in charge of uh, accessibility and ensuring that um, the EAC pushes out uh, information related to uh, ensuring the election process is uh, accessible. Thank you for inviting me to be here this afternoon. Great. Um, so this event today was meant to bring together policy making community and voters with disabilities. Um, we So to start off, I would like to start with a, a question for everyone. Um, what do you think is the biggest fix for accessibility uh, that, that could be implemented relatively easily. Um, and we'll start with, with Ben on that. Thank you. Um, so I think the largest fix that could be implemented um, fairly easily would have to be um, related to just general accessibility and so doing um, disability awareness and etiquette training. I think that as I think inclusivity is a way to decrease barriers that as long as we are thinking of accessibility throughout every step of the elections process, um, you know, then we're going to have then we're going to reduce those barriers naturally. So if 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 everybody from um, policymakers, election workers, poll workers are aware of um, the requirements to um, the accessibility requirements of the ADA or um, the Americans with Disability Act or the National Voter Registration Act, um, then I think um, you know it's naturally people are going to uh, ensure that the process is accessible. So I think probably the lowest lift with the highest impact would be. Um, an awareness um, and accessibility training. Great, uh, Kristan. When we're speaking of policy, it really is difficult, and you know, accessibility is the issue. It's it's difficult to respond to because it's important for people to understand that the deaf community is very diverse. And if we're at, if we have access to information um, through the internet, uh, but if we if there is an issue with um, captioning or other accessibility, and we cannot get the equivalent of information through ASL, uh, then how can we make decisions um, for ourselves and vote accordingly? The deaf community is very active and they're involved in the voting process. However, we don't understand a lot about the true issues. For example, uh, if voting rights are being limited, uh, you know, sometimes the community supports that without realizing that it impacts them as a deaf voter or that it makes it harder for people to vote, especially for those with uh, additional disabilities within the deaf community. So the point is that uh, other organizations are getting out and getting information to the voting community and we need to have the equivalent with the deaf community. And so we are working with deaf organizations to confirm that you know, the information is getting into the deaf community. I wish that we could talk more about all of the points uh, that we'd like to speak to, but I think that's what I could say for now. We want to be careful not to speak on the behalf of all deaf, all deaf people in the deaf community. Again, it's very diverse. I'm a deaf person. I'm BIPOC. Um, I, I'm a deaf person. I recognize that I have a certain amount of privilege with education and access to communication, and other people may not have that. So, uh, so it may be a different experience for them. So, you know, we have a lot of work ahead of us to make sure that we really understand the information and what's accessible for the community. Great, thank you. And Terry? Sorry, it took me a minute to find my unmute button per usual. Um, so I just want to, uh, piggyback on the wonderful answers of my two uh, fellow panelists, I think absolutely correct on both parts. 
the low hanging fruit, I think uh, along the lines of what Anne was saying about inclusivity is also potentially making sure that the election administration process is seen as a customer service based model, right? Which I think we have been seeing um, a move towards with, um, with election officials recognizing that the voters, right, are the people that we should be working to make sure that the process is inclusive and accessible for voters, whether that is voters with disabilities, voters with language needs, voters for whatever reason, you know, uh, needs to have some assistance uh, in making sure they're able to cast their ballot uh, effectively and efficiently. I think um, so that could take on things such as in the language context, perhaps um, voluntarily seeking out bilingual poll workers, right? Um, you, yes, you have to when you're mandated by law to do so, but you can also do it on your own because you see the need in your community and you recognize, hey, you know, um, we can do something to make sure that all voters feel welcome and are able um, to vote. That being said, um, I completely agree with the idea of diversity and making sure that we have all of the different needs and voices at the table in making sure that these um, issues are addressed. So certainly um, just also from the language access con uh, text, one thing that um, happens often where there are jurisdictions covered by law to provide assistance is the creation of advisory committees, right? And again, not something that should only happen because it's mandated by law, but something that seems like it would be um, a very prudent idea for election officials to uh, go out into to their communities virtually, if need be, um, you know, um, and in person when we're able to uh, to hear from community members to see what it is that they need, what are the barriers, what is keeping them from participating, and what the election officials can do to help ameliorate some of those issues. Great, thank you. Um, and, and kind of following up on that, Terry, my, my first question um, is, is for you. Um, so language access is an issue, not just for deaf voters, but for voters with disabilities who come from language minority groups, um, it also people who need um, cognitive accessibility. Um, what can we do to improve language access for all voters? And by we, I mean, you know, what can we do to advocate? What can the government do? Whatever way you want to tackle that question. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, of course, education at all levels, whether that is community members, community groups educating, whether it's uh, the federal government, whether it's the local government, the election officials, all super helpful to make sure that people are aware of their rights. But one thing that I think that we could all also try to lean in and move towards is having um, just generally more accessible ballots, right? And, and in my mind, that means plain language, right? We know that our uh, that the way voting material are written, uh, it's not particularly conducive even for um, native English speakers, right? Or those who only speak English. We also know that in some instances, such as with some ballot initiatives, people actually purposefully write things in a confusing manner to try to get the outcome uh, that they're looking for as opposed to properly educating people about what they're really voting about. So I think that one thing that we collectively could all do is move towards more accessible voting material with respect to language. That means when it comes to translations, it's easier to translate. Whether there, you know, if there are cognitive um, issues at play, then that's also something that's, you know, more accessible. And really for just, um, you know, I'll, I'll say this, one of the points that we often point to in talking about the language access context is that um, some studies that have been done around voting materials show that the level, uh, the educational level, right, or the English level is around 12th grade or higher. That is not what we should have for our voting materials. We really should be having materials that are accessible for all. Yeah, I, I agree. As someone who works in voting rights, sometimes those ballot initiatives, I really have to research them before I go to the polls to try to figure out what they're actually saying um, and what I'm actually voting on. And a lot of times folks don't even know that there's going to be a ballot initiative. Um, and the same even goes for things like voting requirements, like understanding what type of voter ID um, you're able to bring um, and, and that will be accepted. So I, I definitely think that would benefit you know, everyone. Um, and 
going off of that, um, Chris Tan, you had, were talking about accessibility for, for deaf voters. Um, often materials for voter guides and candidate materials are inaccessible to ASL users, particularly when folks don't caption information. Um, what can be done to ensure that people who um, use American Sign Language are getting the information that they need to be involved in the political process? I just want to make sure I understand the question clearly. You're asking me what they can do um, to to make sure that there's access. Yes. What can election officials do, and what can the disability community do to, you know, support advocacy or or um, support the deaf community in pushing for reforms or or whatever changes need to happen to make voting information more accessible to deaf folks. Yes, I see. No, that's great. Well, I think trying to include us as much as possible. There are a lot of great organizations out there that are deaf led and deaf centric organizations who are doing fabulous work. And NAD, for example, National um, Association for the Deaf uh, is in general leading experts with many policies and legal oriented access issues for the deaf community. We also have DHHCAN, which is a deaf and hard of hearing communication. I think it's, okay, I'm not sure. The A, I think is a association network. And it's a coalition of different organizations within the community that come together to develop policies um, and to include the candidates and what their platforms are and make that, um, uh, it's a network. It's there, it's available for the community, but many people are unaware of that. So the, you know, the disabled community, um, it, it has a strong, it has a strong network. And so CSD wants to support people going through the process, trying to find what they're looking for and provide that in, in an accessible format. There are many different deaf led businesses, for example, that are service providers who are experts at providing um, live streaming and captioning as well as many other accessibility support services. So uh, if we have um, deaf people who um, can provide videos in a a American Sign Language to make it accessible. And, you know, it's simply the language is complicated. So to translate that into American Sign Language in a way that is clear and accessible in that visual language um, without having trick questions or without having complicated terminology um, is how we're trying to support the deaf community. Great, thank you. And yeah, you can really see that the language accessibility itself is just such a huge issue for so many groups of people uh, because voting does have a lot of legal language around it, very complicated language that most of us don't encounter um, in our everyday lives. So um, I think that's you know a really big issue. Uh, so Ben, um, you've gotten to work on, on both sides of this issue. Um, previously, you worked in the Protection and Advocacy Network, <clears throat> excuse me, and now you're at the Election Assistance Commission. Having had that experience with the Protection and Advocacy Network um, and, and now at the EAC, uh, what do you think disability advocates could do to get our issues in front of decision makers? Certainly. Um, and so I think the biggest, the biggest um, issue is all politics are local. And so a lot of the decisions that are going to be impacting um, voters with disabilities and voters generally are going to be happening on a, on a local level. So your county or your state and also the, the rules and policies vary from county to county, state to state. And so it's making sure that you're aware of what's going on at your local level and then being able to advocate understanding because a voter or a person with a disability is gonna be the best advocate for themselves. They're going to know 
exactly what is impacting them and their process on the local level, and then finding um, the policymakers who have the ability to influence policy and letting them know, you know, whether or not, you know, taking a look at the EAC and taking a look at some of our um, clearinghouse best practices and saying, okay, well, this is the barrier that we're facing here on in our county or in our state. Um, here's what another state um, is doing. They faced a similar barrier and, you know, this is how they solve this issue. And so, you know, coming to policymakers with solutions and problems um, with that um, personal background, I think, is the best way to um, impact change. Great, thank you. And actually, um, we have a question in the Q&A uh, for you as well, Ben. Um, someone asked, how do you envision awareness and accessibility training to ensure policymakers, election workers, poll workers, et cetera, are educated on the full accessibility requirements and voter accommodations of the Americans with Disabilities Act? Uh, fantastic question. And so what I would envision, um, you know, specifically from probably the poll worker and election officials is um, usually there are uh, training requirements that poll workers have to go through, or if you're signing up to register for voters, um, that I think Contra Costa County in California has a uh, program where uh, they do um, advocacy training, but it would be going through um, the entire voting process and including um, voters with disabilities. So reaching out to my former network or you know, the organizations that Chris Don mentioned, or I mean, there, there are plenty of different disability organizations out there, AAPD, NDRN, um, are what, you know, looking at your local organizations and bringing them in and having a partnership between um, directly impacted people and the um, policymakers who are going to be implementing those uh, election systems. So I think that's what I would envision is local partnerships. And like Terry had mentioned, um, you know, you know, some laws mandate that you create um, these uh, oversight boards or these community um, organizations, but it doesn't have to be that formal. It's great when it is, um, but just reaching out to your local partners finding what the barriers are, um, doing trainings um, when you're and updating it, um, you know, regularly. So as the election laws change that you're contacting the disability organizations, seeing how these laws could impact them and making sure that, um, you know, everybody stays up to date on um, the requirements. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question in the chat from or in the Q&A from Tim White. Um, here in Washington State, the Secretary of State puts out the voter pamphlet in an ASL video format for deaf folks and an MP3 is for the blind. It, it's in English only. 20% of Washington State uh, citizens speak a non-English language at home. Should such services be required for non-English languages in jurisdictions covered by uh, the Voting Rights Act, Section 203? Um, Terry, would you be able to maybe speak to this issue? Sure. So uh, I would certainly say that Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act absolutely would require um, <clears throat> these services to be also be included uh, in the covered languages. Uh, Section 203 requires anything that's provided in English also be provided in the covered language. And as has been um, referenced by numerous speakers right there, we don't have just silos of, oh, there's only a language minority voter or it's only a voter with disability. We do have, <clears throat> I'm sure, plenty of voters with disability that also have language access issues. And so therefore, um, I would say the Section 203 absolutely requires it. Um, and additionally, would also put the plug in and even if it doesn't, um, you know, even in places where Section 203 is not applicable, certainly working with local partners to try to figure out how to provide some of these, um, you know, resources to the community is also another uh, great way to try to help fill the gap. Great, thank you. And Kristan, do you have anything? We've, we've been talking a lot about language access, so I wanted to see if you have anything to add to either what um, Ben or, or Terry said.
I don't have much to add. I think that they hit most of the points. I just want to emphasize that, you know, we w work with local and national organizations as part of our work. And we cannot make change without everyone involved and seeing all perspective and pushing for that change. To go forward, um, you know, I, I think that we need to go back and the interpreter is clarifying. I think it's harder, for example, to move forward and then realize that we're missing key points or key people and go back and repair it. I, you know, I think that's a harder way to go about it. So I think that there's a lot of work, um, you know, to make sure that we're including everyone from the beginning that we're figuring out the solutions and getting them involved in those places and getting it right. It doesn't have to be perfect, but close enough. And, and then we can make adjustments as we go forward before we go forward. Great, thank you. Um, and we have just a, a few minutes left um, for, for our panel, um, just looking at the, the, the comments here. Um, I'm, I'm seeing from, um, from Jenny, I can't see the last name there. It's Jenny Sykes. Um, every state and local government has a, a, an LEP, limited English proficiency requirements. Um, and uh, you can go to lep.gov to learn about those. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, but I, I suppose with, with just a few minutes left, um, is there anything um, else you, that any of you would like to, to share um, in terms of takeaways from this or what, what you think um, folks who are attending this webinar can do to um, push accessibility forward, um, whether that's working with the groups that you work with or, or um, different advocacy um, strategies? So starting with Ben. Thanks, I think that's a great question. Um, I think inclusivity is going to be the key. And so um, getting involved on the state and local level is great. I think volunteering, um, you know, becoming an election worker, you know, um, working within your community to um, register people to vote, becoming a poll worker, um, just getting involved, uh, you know, can definitely help um, increase accessibility. I think the more people are in the community, the more people are um, participating, um, you're going to knock down some of those um, barriers um, because, you know, you have the right to participate in these functions. I think local, I, I think poll workers by and large want to ensure that as many people who are eligible to vote can vote. And so whatever they can control, um, they will try to, you know, ensure that there is accessibility. Um, I think often, um, unfortunately, they're, they may be unaware of the requirements. And so, you know, by participating, by volunteering, by getting involved, you can, you know, help assist, um, given a first person, you know, perspective on what the challenges are and how to overcome them. And so I really would encourage um, everyone, you know, uh, register to vote, you know, first and foremost, um, but then also find out what opportunities exist uh, near you to volunteer and uh, get involved. Thanks. Carrie? Sure, so I, I would just add that uh, we should remember to think about um, the voting process is not just the act of voting, but all of the policies that go into this. I believe Kassan may have touched upon it earlier, but while we're do, working on election reform issues, when we're working on election administration issues, we also have to be a part of the discussion. These issues have to be a part of this discussion so that solutions that are created are created with our communities in mind and our needs in mind. Otherwise, trying to retrofit, if you will, something um, after the fact is uh, much more difficult and less effective um, in actually addressing needs. So I would leave with that. Okay, and we're right at 1.45, but Kristan, and um, anything to add? I think that they filled it in completely, the other two experts on the panel. Thank you so much to our panelists for, for being here today. Um, and I'll hand it back to Robin. Great, thank you so much. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you so much, Sarah, Kristan, 
Terry, Ben, for your uh, remarks and thank you for your advocacy. Um, you know, it's been so informative and I know lots of people that are participating today will have even more questions for all of you. Um, so thank you again to everyone for uh, joining us for the first half of our uh, Disability Vote Summit. We will be taking a short break and we'll resume the second half of our summit at 1.55 p.m. Eastern time. See you then. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Disability Vote Summit that is co-hosted by the National Disability Rights Network and the American Association of People with Disabilities. My name is Lillian O'Leary and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm a medium brown skin, multiracial woman with long dark brown hair and bangs and my background is blurred and I've got a black top on. I am the Rev Up Voting Campaign Coordinator at the American Association of People with Disabilities, and I will be facilitating the second half of this webinar. And thank you to Robin earlier for guiding us through the first half of this event. If you joined us for the earlier parts, I hope that you all feel refreshed and ready for part two. Um, and if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. And I'm very excited that you're gonna be joining us for this event. Before we get started, I'm gonna go through a couple of instructions for the accommodations and logistics for this webinar, just as Robin did at the start of this event. We will have multiple ASL interpreters for this webinar and they should be visible on screen now and we'll switch between each other. And we will also have live captioning provided in English and Spanish. The English captioning is available directly in Zoom by selecting the CC or closed captioning button at the bottom of the Zoom window. We will also have a stream text link for English captioning, which is now in the chat. Um, and we will continue to put the English and Spanish stream text captions in the chat throughout the webinar. So for the Spanish side of things, we have the Spanish captioning um, and audio available. So at the link in the chat, you can access the Spanish closed captioning. And then to access the Spanish audio, select interpretation at the bottom of your screen and choose to listen to the event in Spanish. If you are having any issues accessing the ASL or captioning or any technical issues, you can message the panelists and hosts using the chat function and we will be in contact with you to hopefully resolve any issues. And we are recording this event and we'll share the recording slides and transcript with you afterwards. So if you missed part of the summit, you can check out the whole recording later. For questions, you can use the Q&A box. Um, and we have also um, taken into account questions submitted by email and through the registration form. We also have a couple of helpful links that we will be sharing um, during the um, event um, now and in the future, which include the agenda for this event. So you can get an idea of who is presenting when. And then we also are going to share the link for slides in case you want to check those out ahead of the different sessions. And if you are on social media, you can follow along um, and even add your own posts to the conversations on social media by using the hashtag Disability Vote Summit. And I'll just plug um, again today, this, this whole week is National Disability Voter Registration Week. Um, and so this past weekend, I myself updated my, um, my own residency, I guess, um, to Maryland and got my, uh, and registered to vote in Maryland. Um, and so I encourage you all, um, it just takes a few minutes to check your voter registration um, or to register for the first time um, and so that link is weall.vote backslash rev up. And I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. So I encourage you to take a few minutes while you're participating in this uh, summit and make sure you are registered to vote with the correct address and name and everything. We will have another break at about 3.05 well, we we're gonna break from the panels and presentations for another few messages um, from guest speakers. 
Um, and so with that, um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really, really excited for this um, continued second half of the summit. And I am excited to announce that our next two messages will be from Susan Diegelman and Kim Wyman. Susan Diegelman is a director of federal public affairs at AT&T and chair of the board of directors at the American Association of People with Disabilities. And Kim Wyman is the secretary of state of Washington. So thank you to both of them for providing messages for today. Good afternoon, I'm Susan Diegelman, Chair of the AAPD Board of Directors. Thank you for joining today's Disability Vote Summit. We are here today to learn about the experience of voters with disabilities during the 2020 elections and discuss the next steps in our advocacy work to continue to empower people with disabilities and strengthen our voting bloc. National Disability Voter Registration Week is about building and harnessing the power of the disability vote. This summit is a great opportunity to learn more about the power of our vote, and it's only one of many events taking place this week to mark National Disability Voter Registration Week, being recognized September 13th through the 20th this year. According to the New American Economy Research Fund, the 2020 election proved to be the most diverse electorate in U.S. history. The disability voting bloc has grown eight and a half percentage points since 2012. That's three million additional voters. We are power unto ourselves, but consider our influence grows when we work together with all other communities that we are a part of, Latinx, Black, Asian American, LGBTQ+, and others. In the last election, an estimated 38 million people with disabilities were eligible to vote but we know that people with disabilities voted at a rate of seven percentage points lower than other people of the same age without disabilities. This points to a continuing gap in disability voter turnout. It's safe to say that we have our work cut out for us. We invite national, state, and local organizations to participate in all of the events happening this week to continue to raise the disability voice and civic participation across the country in 2021 and beyond. You can find a calendar of events, partner toolkits, and other resources on the AAPD website at aapd.com slash ndvrw. If you are new to this discussion, welcome, and thank you for spending this time with us to learn more about increasing power of the disability community in our election process. If you've been on board with this work since the beginning, we can see the results of your work. You have moved the needle and you have made a difference for people with disabilities. Thank you for your continued hard work and dedication. Hello, I'm Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman. I'm truly grateful for the opportunity to be part of this year's Disability Vote Summit. Every day, more than 10,000 election officials nationwide are dedicated to preserving your constitutional right to vote. Despite the challenges we've faced over the last couple of years, and as we get closer to the November 2nd general election, we are unwavering in our commitment. The ongoing pandemic continues to shape the way we administer elections, especially for people with disabilities. We believe no one should ever choose whether to vote or risk their health. So we're working hard to ensure our voting processes are safe, secure, and accessible for everyone. Yet before you vote, it's a good idea to plan ahead. For starters, make sure you're registered and that your registration is up to date. If you vote by absentee ballot, request your ballot as soon as possible. Election officials need time to prepare ballot materials and mail them to you. If you live in a vote by mail state, you can protect your health and others by sending your ballot in the mail or placing it in an official drop box. In Washington, for example, people can vote as early as 18 days before an election. Check to see if your state has an early voting option so you can avoid the election day rush. Some states, including Washington, offer voters with disabilities online and in-person assistance, including accessible voting units. Contact your elections office for more information about these and other services available to you. 
As we get closer to November, be critical of the election information you see or hear on the news or social media. Misinformation and disinformation campaigns seek to sow discord and threaten the foundation of our democracy. If you come across something that doesn't seem true, ask your Secretary of State or local elections official. Help us dispel myths and falsehoods by sharing information from trusted sources. Finally, election offices across the country are facing staffing shortages. If you are able, I encourage you to consider volunteering at your local office. We are all responsible for the success of our democracy. Free and fair elections are at the very heart of that success. So stay safe, say well, and remember to vote. Um, so I wanted to say thank you so much to Susan Diegelman and Secretary Wyman for providing those messages of encouragement and advice for making sure our votes count in this year's elections. I'm really excited to introduce our next uh, speakers, Dr. Douglas Cruz and Dr. Lisa Schur, two very talented researchers and professors. Douglas Cruz is a distinguished professor in the School of Management and Labor Relations at Rutgers University, a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a research fellow at the IZA Institute for the Study of Labor in Bonn, Germany. Dr. Lisa Schur is a professor and past chair of the Department of Labor Studies and Employment Relations at Rutgers University, where she teaches employment law and labor studies. And Doug and Lisa have been conducting surveys of voters with disabilities for many years, providing valuable insight into the experiences of voters with disabilities in elections. And they're gonna present what their most recent data says about the disability vote in the 2020 elections. So take it away, Doug and Lisa. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Doug Cruz. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a white male with gray hair. I also use a wheelchair due to paraplegia, although the wheelchair is not visible on the, on the screen here. Um, I'll let Lisa start. Lisa, you can introduce yourself and. And let me uh, bring up the uh, bring up our PowerPoint. Let's um, see here. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Lisa Shore. I use she and her. I am a white woman. I wear glasses and I have um, brown hair. So the questions we've looked at when we've done surveys or how likely were people with disabilities to vote? And the latest one is how likely were people with disabilities to vote in 2020? And then among people who voted, how many used mail-in ballots or the option of voting early? And how did the 2020 disability turnout compare to past elections? To answer these and other questions, what we did was we analyzed data from the November 2020 voting and registration supplement in the Census Bureau's current population survey. And this contains responses from 81,898 voting, voting eligible citizens, and that includes 11,000 citizens with disabilities. So we compare this, these data to 2016 when there was a sample of 93,794, which included 12,791 people with disabilities. Now, how do we define disability and how is it used here? Disability is defined in the census surveys by a yes answer to one or more of six questions and they identify hearing impairments, visual impairments, mental or cognitive impairments, difficulty or walking, walking or climbing stairs, difficulty inside the home with activities such as dressing or bathing, and difficulty going outside the home doing errands alone. The key result is that voter turnout surged in 2020 among people with disabilities. It was an increase of 5.9 percentage points from 2016, and that's compared to an increase of 5.3 percentage points for people without disabilities. We see that seven 18.7 million people with disabilities voted in 2020, and that represent, represents 11.4% of all voters. 
So we see a real increase here. And this surge in turnout occurred across all the major types of disability. Um, the biggest change was um, actually difficulty going, I'm sorry, um, mental or cognitive impairment, um, but we saw the larger, the most people voting who had hearing impairments. However, you know, that's the good news, but people with disabilities did remain less likely than people without disabilities to vote, although that disability turnout gap may have slightly narrowed. So there's still this um, disability turnout gap. In 2016, it was 6.3%, and in 2020, it's 5.7%. So why do we see this turnout gap, this disability turnout gap that seems very persistent? It is not explained by lower interest in politics and elections among people with disabilities, as shown in polls. Past research shows that the gap is partly explained by people with disabilities having lower resources, such as income and education. Uh, people with disabilities also tend to be more socially isolated. They're more likely to live alone. They're less likely to be employed, and that contributes to lower turnout. Uh, people with disabilities uh, tend to have a lower belief that the political system is responsive to uh, people with disabilities' needs. And a big factor is voting difficulties. We worked with the EAC, the Election Assistance Commission, on a 2020 post-election national survey with 2,569 respondents. Um, and the results on voter turnout and method were very similar between this survey and the census data. In addition, the EAC survey found that one in nine, 11% of voters with disabilities in 2020 experienced difficulties in voting, which was almost twice the rate of voters without disabilities. So 11% um, of voters with disabilities had difficulty voting compared to 6% of voters without disabilities. Combined with the census turnout data, we estimate that 1.95 million people with disabilities had some difficulties voting in 2020. Now that is a significant improvement from a similar 2012 survey when one quarter, 26% of voters with disabilities reported problems in voting compared to 7% of voters without disabilities. So we've really seen um, improvement. At least half of the improvement was due to greater accessibility of polling places since 2012 while the other half resulted from the shift to increased voting by mail during the pandemic. Okay. Um, Should I? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to Doug now. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say just a little more about our findings on the, uh, uh, on, on the 2020 voting here. Yeah. Um, people with disabilities are historically more likely than those without disabilities to vote by mail about five percentage points more likely in general. The 2020 census data showed that only one fourth, 26% of voters with disabilities voted at a polling place on election day, the traditional method of voting, compared to 31% of voters without disabilities. Voters with disabilities were also less likely to vote early at a polling place or election office, 21% compared to 27%. They were more likely to vote by mail, 53%. Just over half voted by mail compared to 42% of people without disabilities. The increase in voting by mail between 2016 and 2020 was actually very similar between voters with disabilities and those without disabilities, 24 and 22 points. So it, you know, the, obviously there was a big increase in voting uh, by mail due to the pandemic. Um, that increase due to the pandemic was similar for people with and without disabilities. Voting by mail is not easy for everyone. Sometimes people think, oh, that, that's uh, not gonna make it nice and easy. Um, in, in our survey, we found that 22%, over one fifth of people with visual impairments reported difficulty voting with a mail ballot, uh, which is obviously a real concern. Um, I, I should say we, we're presenting lots and lots of numbers yeah. here. All of these numbers are available in, in reports we've done. 
uh, we, we don't want to make people's uh, people uh, uh, become uh, we don't want like as with our students we don't want <laughs> students to be overwhelmed by numbers and so we don't want you to be overwhelmed by numbers um, but uh, we think uh, we think these numbers are important we do a breakdown by demographic factors the surge in turnout among people with disabilities occurred across major demographic categories women and men blacks hispanic latinx white non-hispanic latinx and other other race and multiracial uh, different age groups and the different regions so across all of those people with disabilities were more likely to vote uh, uh, in 2020 than in 2016. also as in past elections there was no turnout gap between employed people with and without disabilities. Employment appears to play a very positive role in political inclusion, as well as economic inclusion of people with disabilities. We've written about this in the past. Uh, just a few more numbers here for you. Um, we're really interested in getting to your questions, any questions you may have. On voter registration, eligible citizens with disabilities were three points less likely to be registered to vote than those without disabilities. 70% compared to 73%. Among those who were registered, people with disabilities were four points less likely to vote, 88 compared to 92%. So that overall disability turnout gap that Lisa talked about um, is due both to lower registration and lower turnout among those who were registered. We find that registered people with disabilities were more likely than those without disabilities to register at a town hall or election office, less likely to register at the Department of Motor Vehicles. People with disabilities are less likely to have uh, driver's licenses. Asked why they did not register, non-registered people with disabilities were more likely to give permanent illness or disability as a reason, and less likely to say that they were not interested in the election or did not meet registration deadlines. Reasons for not voting, the, the Census Bureau asked people if you uh, were registered but did not vote, why didn't you vote? Um, among this group, just over one third of people with disabilities said they did not vote because of illness or disability, their, their own or families. They were less likely than non voters without disabilities to say that they were not interested, uh, did not like the candidates or campaign issues, or were too busy. The percent saying they did not vote due to concerns about the coronavirus pandemic was similar between people with and without disabilities, 5% and 4%, which we found, we found interesting. The last few numbers here, um, obviously different states had different rules on mail ballot access. The increase in voter turnout appears to be larger in states that made it easier to vote by mail. Although the differences were not strong enough to be outside the margin of error here. Still, it's interesting looking at the increase in voter turnout, the states that had no change in mail ballot access um, had increases of 4.9 and 5.0% among people with and without disabilities. The uh, turnout, the, the increase was higher among um, people with disabilities in states that made it easier to request a mail ballot in 2020 compared to 2016, um, seven, a 7% increase and in states where all voters were sent ballots in 2020, but not in 2016, uh, in seven states, one of those states being New Jersey, where we live, uh, we all received a ballot which in 2020, which we had not in 2016, and the surge was 6.7% um, in those states. So the increased access to mail ballots seemed to, uh, seemed to help turnout among people both with and without disabilities. The key takeaways here uh, to, to sort through all this, we found that voter turnout surged in 2020 among people with disabilities. So despite the barriers they often face, people with disabilities are just as interested in elections as people without disabilities, and they turn out to vote when motivated. The turnout gap did remain, however, between people with and without disabilities in 2020. And as Lisa said, combined with the results of voting difficulties from our survey with the EAC last year, we estimate that 1.95 million voters with disabilities, almost 2 million voters with disabilities, 
encountered some type of difficulty voting in the 2020 general elections. And these are just the people who voted. This is not count people who may have not voted because of uh, expecting some kind of difficulties. More takeaways, people with disabilities are more likely than those without disabilities to use a mail ballot. The increase in mail ballots during the pandemic was similar between people with and without disabilities. But mail ballots, a very important point, are not a panacea. The large variation in types and severity of disabilities means that one size fits all does not work for many people. Having more options on how to vote will help to turn out the people with disabilities. This is a point that Lisa and I often make when the journalists talk to us about this, is that the most important thing, given the variation in the disability population, is that uh, there'd be lots of different methods. Uh, it's not one size fits all. We need lots of different methods to accommodate lots of different types of disabilities. Uh, past research indicates inaccessible voting systems can discourage turnout, not only by making it difficult to vote, but also through the psychological effects by sending the message that people with disabilities are not welcome in the political sphere. And finally, um, the improved accessibility since 2012 is likely to have helped turnout among people with disabilities in 2020. We, we were a bit surprised and very pleased to see the size of the improvement since, mm -hmm. since 2012 um, in, uh, in voting accessibility. And that reflects well on the efforts of disability advocates and organizations, um, uh, such as the ones we're involved with here, the EAC, election officials, policymakers. But obviously, there's a need for continued progress in improving accessibility and ensuring people with disabilities can easily exercise the right to vote. We welcome any questions. Uh, we, we certainly want to make these results as useful as possible for increasing access to voting among people with disabilities. And I will stop sharing there. Hi, thank you so much, both Doug and Lisa, for sharing your research. Um, every time that I hear you talk, I learn more um, from your research and, and think more about what it means for our advocacy work going forward. Um, we do have lots of questions, so I'm going to start with I'm going to start with one that kind of gets towards the beginning of your research process. So, earlier in this um, earlier in this session, um, in, in the first part of today's event, we had a question for other researchers that I wanted to ask y'all as well. Um, what are your strategies for reaching voters or potential voters that do not have access to the internet or broadband? That is a really good question. Um, we have worked with a survey research firm, um, SSRS, and this, this issue has come up. So they tend to split it between reaching people by telephone and reaching out through, through the internet. And that way to try and get people who, you know, there is this digital divide between people with and without disabilities. So we wanna make sure that they can um, compensate for that. Yeah, that, that, that's a really important point. The, yeah. uh, and, and in fact, that's a point we made when we presented these results to the Election Assistance Commission, mm -hmm. that oftentimes the, uh, the, 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 the solutions you know, that people offer right. for increasing turnout among people with disabilities have to do with you know, some kind of electronic right. method, you know, a new, right. new website, new outreach through the internet. Um, but one of the points that we made is that the, and this is based on census data, 18%, um, 1-8%, almost, almost one-fifth of people with disabilities live in households without internet access. Yeah. And that's compared to only 6% of people without disabilities living in homes without internet access. So there's a real digital divide there. And that raises questions both for mm -hmm. our research, you know, yeah. working with SSRS, trying to reach people to to, to find out their views, but also more importantly for um, outreach efforts. Right, by states and election officials, if they think you know you can just do it all on the web through the internet, that's just not true. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I think some of the the digital divide. I mean, some of it is due to age that people with disabilities are older or tend to be older 
than people without disabilities. And some of it has to do with poverty as well. And some of it has to do with, you know, people in rural areas who might not just have very good internet. Absolutely. Um, thanks for addressing that question. Um, the next question that I wanted to ask is from Tim. Do you have a breakdown of your data by language? Um, and then Tim mentioned there's a huge weakness where the Voting Rights um, Act Section 203 language rights um, must compete with ADA or HAVA requirements. Um, so he also says often it is an either or choice, not a both and. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a bit and kind of what you think is going on there. Um, we can also tag this question to answer um, more fully if, if you don't have a, a full, if you don't feel you have a full answer. Um, yeah, well, yeah. On, on the language issue, at least in the survey we do, it's uh, uh, our survey is translated into Spanish. Um, but 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 just in Spanish, not into other languages. Um, and I honestly, I, ha I haven't done the breakdown. Right. We haven't done the breakdown there of, of the Spanish language versus uh, versus English language. Um, but that's that would be a useful thing yeah, to do. But that, yeah, but that would be useful. Yeah. Um, and on that second question, I think uh, we'd have to think about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't have a quick response off the top of our heads or top of my head at any rate. No, I... <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for answering. And thank you, Tim. You've, you've given them a new idea for their 2022 research. So that's great. Um, the next question that I wanted to bring up is from Jean Martinez. And he asks, does the data measure the turnout of people with cognitive disabilities like autism or intellectual and developmental disabilities? That's another really good question. And um, I think that the census, the way they use cognitive or measure cognitive disabilities has some difficulties. They say, do you have difficulty um, remembering, concentrating, or making decisions? And that is very under-inclusive measure. So if you don't, if you might have some sort of um, emotional or cognitive disability that doesn't affect those particular um, activities and you wouldn't be counted under that. So the answer is not enough, I think, that yet yeah, it will get some people with um, conditions such as autism, but it will miss others. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, that, that, that's right. And I, I should mention that this, this, the six census questions that Lisa presented, have, have, they, they do have that one question about cognitive disabilities. Um, the, the, those six questions are under-inclusive. They don't yes, capture everyone. Yep. Because of that, uh, in, in our survey, uh, I should have mm -hmm. mentioned this, in the surveys we've done sponsored by the Election Assistance Commission, we add the seventh question, uh, kind of a, hopefully a catch-all question. It, the, the question mm -hmm. is, do you have any uh, long-term condition or impairment, I hope I get this right, um, that limits your ability to participate in work, housework, or any other major life activity. So we're yeah. trying to take a, a, you know, cast a wide net here and capture anything that would be covered by the ADA in terms of limiting a major life activity. Yeah. And, and that would capture some of those other uh, although again, conditions. Although again, it, it would probably still be under-inclusive for, for a lot of um, mental and emotional disabilities. But yeah, yeah it's, it's an improvement, I think, over what, what's there. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I, I definitely think that that's an interesting issue where, you know, the, the data might even, there might even be more people in, in the survey um, to gather data on, um, and definitely a, a good project to, to um, even think more about how we can have a more inclusive definition. Um, and I think that that's a challenge that a lot of organizations um, recognize um, in other institutions. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna ask one more question. Um, and hopefully we have time for a few more and de uh, afterwards. Um, and so the next question is, what do you think led to the big increase in voter turnout in 2020? Um, and, and that was another question from earlier, sorry. Um, I think it's a, a number of factors. I think um, there were people felt very passionately about this election. There was a lot of, um, uh, strong feelings about who was going to be um, president and other other issues. And also because of the pandemic, 
a lot of states really made it easier to vote. So as Doug mentioned, New Jersey, we were sent a mail-in ballot and we could use it or not use it as we wanted and everybody was sent one. So making it easier, taking away some of the barriers that people encounter definitely increased turnout among people with disabilities. So I think those two things, and I think also there has been improvement in the accessibility of polling places as well. That has been um, a concern over the years. And we did find that fewer people experienced difficulties in polling places. There were also things like drop boxes and, and other, um, other things that people could use just to make it easier. And as Doug said, the more options that people have, the more choices they have, the, the higher, I think, turnout will be among people with disabilities because one side does not fit all. Like um, you could say that, oh, well, if everybody just goes to mail-in voting, things will be great. But for like a lot of people with visual impairments or who are blind, um, mail-in voting is, might not be a great solution and they might have a much better time um, in person. So we need to just be cognizant of the variety of methods and the variety of needs that people with disabilities have. I, I think Lisa, you know, named the, mo name the most important things accounting for that increase. One thing that we are um, very encouraged by, and as I say, uh, slightly surprised, but pleasantly surprised by, was the improvement in voting accessibility. Yep. And I think that makes a difference. The, back in 2012, we found 30%, almost one third of mm -hmm. people with disabilities who voted in a polling place said they had difficulties in doing that. That number decreased to 18% um, in, in 2020. Um, now, 18% is still yeah. far too many, of course, but that's a big improvement. Um, and and, and that, that's really a testament to a lot of the work that's uh, yeah. been done on improving voting accessibility. And I think that did help turn out. But as Lisa says, the, the interest in the election and the, uh, and, and the general increase in uh, 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 voting options, yeah. including voting by mail, were really big factors too. And I wanted to add a quick follow-up question. Um, so Jacob um, asked, do you think disability issues played a role in increased turnout, or was it solely a reflection of more accessible elections and the national environment? So I was wondering if you could maybe add on to that answer a little bit. I don't know. What do you think? I think... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, issues like healthcare. The healthcare was a big was a big issue in this last election, and, um, and many people care about healthcare, but it's particularly salient for people with disabilities. This is this is really important to getting access to to healthcare. So I think that motivated um, a lot of people. I think um, some of the other policies that were um, up for debate. Um, Medicare accessibility, I mean, you know, cutting, cutting benefits, for example, for people and things like that. I think those were really big motivating factors for a lot of people with disabilities. But I think it's also that people with disabilities are also very engaged in the broad issues that the election um, was about. Definitely. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and I want to ask one more question um, before um, before we close um, with this, this presentation. What did your data say about the differences in experiences of white disabled voters versus disabled mm. voters of color? Well, one of the things we looked at was time waiting in a polling place. And lo just looking among people with disabilities, we found that Black voters with disabilities waited twice as long in lines to vote in polling places than white voters with disabilities. Um, and, but in some other measures, there really wasn't a difference. Right, you right, know? yeah. Black voters with disabilities were no more likely than white voters with right. disabilities to describe difficulties in general. Um, but this except one- Except for that, the, this the, one, the waiting in line. Waiting in line thing. Um, but that's a bit, obviously a big issue because um, if you have a disability and it's really difficult for you to stand and there are no chairs where you can wait, that might make it impossible for you to, you know, wait 
an hour and a half to vote or longer. <laughs> we, it, we, we did see the increase in turnout yeah. among from 2016 to 2020 among both white and black voters with disabilities, which is mm -hmm. very encouraging. Yeah. Um, but there still does remain a, yeah. uh, a turnout gap um, by disability status within, uh, within those groups across racial categories. Yeah, and I definitely think that confirms what we know just anecdotally and in other data about the voting population in general. Um, that disabled voters of color will face compounding barriers yeah. Um, yeah. with their um, multiple identities and, and the just the range of barriers that um, both voters of color and disabled voters experience. Um, and so I, I definitely think that that's an important point when we think about um, what, what are, what, 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 where should we be working and, and, and where are kind of the gaps in our advocacy um, going forward. Um, and so with that, thank you both so, so much for presenting your data and asking and answering all of these questions. Um, so thank you so much. Oh, I just want to say if people have any more questions for us, they can email us um, and we'd be, we'd be happy to, to, to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I feel free to put your email in the chat. Yes, we'll do that. Okay, we will do that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you so much. Great, so up next, we have the National Disability right, Rights Network's own Jack Rosen, um, who is a voter engagement specialist, and he's been a key part of actually planning this event, and will be sharing NDRN's polling data, which asked a few, quick, a few key questions of people after they voted in 2020 to better understand perspectives on disability and disability issues among voters. Um, so go ahead, Jack. Thanks, Lillian. Uh, today we've heard a lot about the experiences of voters with disabilities at the polling place. We've heard about the numerous barriers they face and how they turn out uh, last year in record numbers in spite of those barriers. At NDRN, we wanted to explore something a bit different. Uh, we wanted to know what drives the disability vote so that our advocacy could better reflect the needs of those who we serve and so that policymakers of all parties could do a little more to reach out to our community. So we partnered with Lake Research and the Terrence Group to poll voters with disabilities on what mattered to them. Uh, also, just because I forgot to at the top, uh, Jack Rosen, he, him pronouns. I'm a white male with uh, brown hair and a beard, uh, wearing a blue button down shirt, and I'm in front of a gray and white virtual NDRN background. So getting into the uh, methodology of this study, uh, Lake Research and the Terrence Group administered this pre-election survey uh, from October 31st to November 3rd, 2020. Uh, these, a total of 2,400 voters were reached nationwide who had either already voted in the 2020 election or were planning to on that upcoming Tuesday. Uh, 1,335 interviews were conducted among voters reached by cell phone, including 600 interviews completed by text to online. Uh, 1,065 interviews among voters were conducted on landlines. Issue questions reached a total of 1,200 voters nationwide as part of this survey. Um, among the 2,400 respondents overall, 359 self-identified as people with disabilities. Among the 1,200 who were polled on the issues that mattered to them most, 179 were people with disabilities. Uh, one other quick note on methodology, due to some rounding of numbers in this presentation, uh, they may not always add up to 100%. At times they may add up to 99% uh, or 101%. One thing we want to highlight, and we actually got um, a question about this earlier in the day, is that the disability vote is a large swath of voters, but in some ways it's even bigger than you might expect. 
15% of voters in our survey self-reported as being a person with a disability. However, an additional 25% of voters reported having a close family member who is disabled. Well, it's important to understand that the priorities of people with disabilities and their family members are not always identical and sometimes can be um, contradictory. It's still worth noting just how wide a swath of the population is touched by the issues impacting people with disabilities. So getting into the results, I'm sure many of you want to know uh, when voters with disabilities overcame those barriers we've discussed today and cast their ballots, who did they vote for? Well, according to our survey, 51% uh, of voters with disabilities voted for uh, President Trump and 47% voted for then candidate, now President Joe Biden. Um, in the swing states, the gap was uh, notably a bit wider with 55% of voters with disabilities surveyed having voted for Trump and 44% having voted for Biden. I should caution though that when looking at the swing states, we have a relatively small sample size. so. If we were polling a larger group there, we might not necessarily see the same gap. Still, this was evidence of a shift from 2016, uh, when a couple of years ago, we conducted a survey also with Lake Research, asking people who they voted for in 2016. We found a plurality of people with disabilities voted for uh, Secretary Clinton, 49% uh, to be precise, well, 46% voted for then candidate Trump. The down ballot votes were even more closely split. In fact, according to our survey, 49% of voters with disabilities cast a ballot for Democratic congressional candidates and 49% voted for Republican congressional candidates. The gap in the swing states, uh, well, notable was a bit less pronounced than at the top of the ballot. 52% reported voting for a Republican congressional candidate, while 47% reported voting for a Democratic candidate. Um, in 2016, a majority of voters in all states in our survey, 54% uh, voted for the Democratic congressional candidate. Uh, so we do again see evidence of something of a shift, though less pronounced and likely reflective of larger shifts in the electorate that we saw in 2020. So we, we know how they vote, but, but what issues mattered to voters with disabilities? Among voters with disabilities, perhaps unsurprisingly, the top issue was the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this shouldn't come as a surprise to many, given that the disability community has often by the, been among the most impacted by the pandemic from um, the disease itself to uh, being isolated to not necessarily sometimes even being able to connect with service providers. You know, this pandemic has had a real impact and that's reflected by the fact it was the most commonly cited top issue. The next most important issue was the economy and jobs, which 22% listed as their top priority. Healthcare was a bit of an interesting one. In the past, um, it has been a top issue among surveys of people with disabilities and was surprisingly not this time, with 15% of voters with disabilities ranking it as their most important issue. In contrast, in a survey conducted uh, by Lake Research in 2019, in the months before the start of the pandemic, 21% listed healthcare as their top issue. So while we saw a shift away from healthcare here, I would caution that it's quite possibly a temporary shift, especially given the overlap between the issues surrounding the pandemic, healthcare, and even uh, Medicare. 
One thing I want to highlight is that I previously said uh, the issues that are important to people with their with disabilities and their family members can diverge. And here we have one interesting example. Only 10% of family members of those with disabilities listed Social Security and Medicare as their top issue. But 17% of people with disabilities in our survey did, reflecting the fact that for people with disabilities, these Social Security and Medicare aren't just hypotheticals, but essential services. So we've heard what matters to people with disabilities and how they voted, but what did they actually hear from the candidates? The truth is the overwhelming majority of voters, not just those with disabilities, do not recall hearing, seeing, or reading anything about the issues important to people with disabilities from either presidential or congressional candidates. Among all voters, when asked if they recall any mention of disability issues, the answer is a resounding no. 63% said they did not recall reading, seeing, or hearing anything from congressional or presidential campaigns about the issues that are important to people with disabilities. While African American voters were notably more likely, um, eight points more likely than white voters, we still see a solid majority saying they did not see the campaigns prioritizing the issues that matter to voters with disabilities. Now, the data on this slide is, as I said, looking at all voters, not just those with disabilities. Voters with disabilities, of course, are going to be more attuned to the issues impacting them and more on the lookout for statements about those issues. So what was their experience during the 2020 election? The truth is they didn't notice much more emphasis on the issues that mattered to them. 41% uh, of voters with disabilities recalled hearing, seeing, or reading anything from the campaigns compared to 31% of voters overall. Women with disabilities were a bit more likely at 46%, but still, even among voters with disabilities in every category of our survey, the no's never dropped below 50%. Ironically, in the battleground states, which are flooded with ads and campaigning, uh, people with disabilities were actually less likely to recall seeing any emphasis on the issues that mattered to their community. One small finding uh, worth noting, among those who had heard about disability policy issues, they were two points more likely to have uh, voted for Biden over Trump. 33% uh, to 31%. And yet, despite not hearing about these issues, the majority of voters overall believe it's important that the candidates address them. Uh, looking at voters overall, 86% rated as important, with 60% saying it is very important for congressional and presidential campaigns to address the issues that are important to people with disabilities. African American voters were particularly likely to place an emphasis on these issues, with 77% saying they thought it was very important. And voters with disabilities clearly want to see more emphasis on the issues that mattered to them. 81% say it is very important for candidates to address these issues, with 12% saying it's somewhat important. Uh, with rounding, that's 94% of all voters with disabilities rating it as important. Among those age 50 and up, 86% rated it as very important. And in the swing states, which again are inundated with ads about every conceivable issue. 79% of voters with disabilities said it was very important to see the campaigns address these. So just what do they want to see though? 76% uh, of voters overall strongly agree that people with disabilities need to be involved in the decision-making process. 73% of voters 
uh, want disability issues include in national discussions about health care. And 70% strongly believe candidates and campaigns should reach out to and include people with disabilities. 43% uh, of voters overall said that issues around disability and health care influence how motivated they are to vote. And 38% said that it impacts who they'll vote for. But among voters with disabilities, they unsurprisingly agree with these statements even more strongly. 81%, 81% believe candidates should reach out to and include people with disabilities. 79% believe America's leaders should fight stigma and bias that limit opportunities for people with disabilities. And 85% believe that people with disabilities should be at the decision-making table. And notably, and I think there's one thing I'd like any candidates or policymakers attending to you know, keep in mind, 54% of people with disabilities say those stances influence who they'll vote for. And 50% said those stances or potentially lack thereof motivated, uh, influenced how motivated they are to vote. And clearly the pandemic has had an influence. Uh, when we surveyed voters with disabilities in 2019, 40% strongly agreed that these issues influenced how motivated they are to vote. But in 2020, when we surveyed voters with disabilities again, uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, 50% strongly agreed with that statement that issues around disability motivate, uh, influence how motivated I am to vote. Uh, one last finding, if you're wondering a bit uh, more about what are disability issues, a major one is health care. 70% of people with disabilities in our survey, including 61% of response in the swing states, um, are very or somewhat concerned that cuts to the health care or changes to the ACA would have a negative impact on people with disabilities. But that's not the only issue that matters to people with disabilities. Um, from the economy and jobs, to immigration, to racial justice in the environment, to taxes. Virtually every issue of our day has a disability component to it. So if you're a candidate or policymaker, I can't encourage you enough to connect with the disability community on the ground uh, where they're at. Get in touch with activists um, at the local protection and advocacy agency. Get in touch with the folks at the local rev up chapter on the ground in your state. Uh, reach out to the folks advocating for inclusion. Develop a platform that in includes what you do for the disability community. Because as today's panels and presentations have hopefully imparted, voters with disabilities are a large voting block, but one who have not always had their needs met. Uh, I'll now be taking any questions. Hi, Jack. Thank you so much um, for sharing those findings. We do have a few questions. Um, I'm going to start by one um, that we received a bit earlier from Hacinda. Um, Asinda was asking about data in Texas, and I was wondering, I know you mentioned something about um, the state-by-state state data in swing states, but I was wondering, um, does any of this data go down to the state level? Um, among voters with disabilities, I don't think so due to a uh, sample size. I think it would be, um, you couldn't necessarily reliably infer findings at the state level but I'll look into that to see if there's anything for Texas, given that's a larger state, we may have had more uh, respondents from it. Awesome. Um, and then we had some similar questions um, from, so I'll go through some similar, some similar questions um, from Andrew. Um, Andrew asks, is there a breakdown of preferences by age as well? Um, there were some, it was divided into 
over 50 and under 50 so that we could um, give those findings with a uh, degree of statistical confidence. Gotcha. Um, I'm gonna, so Carolyn asked a question um, and if you don't have the answer to this, um, then we can also flag the question um, and, and try to answer it after the event. Um, but Carolyn noticed the 17% concern about immigration um, compared to 10 to 12% for others. Um, is, is that meaning, I think that means that's meaning the 17% um, uh, focus on immigration among voters with disabilities versus 10 to 12 among those without. I was wondering if you could maybe go back to that slide um, or if you have, um, if you have like thoughts on why that is, if you don't, um, we can flag the question and just make sure to answer it after. Um, offhand, I, I don't have thoughts and I'm, I'm a little scared to try to share my slides again in case I bump the interpreter off. Um, I'm happy to follow up on that question, but I would say that, you know, folks with disabilities are a diverse group that largely reflect the um, American population as a whole. So uh, many times their priorities will be in line with what uh, many voters care about. All right, looking through, we got a lot of different questions. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm sorting through all of them. Um, one question that um, we had, so I'm curious about the data around people remembering um, disability being mentioned uh, by candidates. Um, and within the disability community, we pay close attention to when candidates mention disability in the election cycle. Um, and in 2020, it seemed like there were a lot of gains um, in the presence of disability in campaign platforms and debates. Um, but in the number, I think, of people that um, did not have a disability and remembered disability being mentioned to me seemed pretty low. Um, so I was wondering what you think, um, what, what you think we can do to change that data point? Um, two things I, I'd say. One, um, when candidates of either or any party uh, mention it, you know, there's uh, Activists can, of course, highlight that, um, sticking within whatever rules may apply them at, if they work at a 501c3 organization. Another thing that can be done, though, is encouraging candidates to pick up a disability platform. Um, as Kurt Decker noted in the opening remarks today, um, it took several debates before we saw a question about disability asked. And really, you know, I have to credit the great folks over at Crip the Vote and a lot of others who kind of did not let up and made sure that we saw those issues on the table. So I think the best thing you can do is encourage candidates to say what they'll do for people with disabilities. Great. I'm going to, so we have two questions from Jacob. So I'm going to ask the first one and then we'll get to the second one. Um, so Jacob asks, what was your geographic breakdown for respondents? Um, how did you wait for region? Did you find that results were in line with the general election results in their states and counties? Um, so telephone numbers were drawn from the target smart voter file and it was the sample was stratified geographically uh, based on the proportion of likely voters in each region. Um, and then there was some further weighting based on 2020 exit polls to try to make sure the data accurately reflected uh, the geographic makeup. And I'm sorry, Lillian, could you remind me the second half of that question if I didn't address it? Um, I, I think you addressed it. Um, so the essential question was um, basically, did you find the data reflected? Did you find that, the, that if any data was broken down by region, did that seem accurate to the election results for that region? Um, it did, though. I'll acknowledge with any survey of voters, you'll always get a slight um, 
oversampling of people who reported voting when they did not, uh, but that's common in pretty much any survey of voters. Gotcha. Okay, so the second part of that question from Jacob was, what states did you consider swing states? Uh, I believe the there were 11 swing states that they looked at in 2020. Um, offhand, I believe they were New Hampshire, Minnesota, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, and Texas. Uh, and I believe they were considered as the states most likely to flip or be very close in 2020. Cool. Um, so I actually wanted to go back to um, the question. I, I, I had a thought on, on the question that we asked a bit earlier about um, engaging candidates. Um, and I think that one of the key, um, one of the key thoughts that I'm having kind of reflecting on the data is um, particularly around the candidates mentioning disability and then also um, I was really interested in the um, values of, of disability inclusion um, that were highly um, approved of by um, the survey respondents, but then I, I, I would say most of us don't, would say that we don't really see that reflected in our policies and in our society at large. Um, there's been progress made, but um, I was just, I, I think I, I see that and I'm slightly surprised um, by how that, that reminds me of the discrepancy between what, what people will say um, they believe, but then what we see in reality um, when it comes to um, the policies that shape our lives. Um, and so one thing I wanted to just share is that um, Rev Up, one of the things that Rev Up does and that I think, um, and we've even partnered with, you know, protection and advocacy agencies as a part of the Net National Disability Rights Network um, to be hosting candidate forums. Um, we have a candidate survey template as well. Um, and I think that that is one tool that um, anyone can really use to engage um, candidates more on issues and get them to really start thinking, hey, um, this is this is an important, you know, we, we are a big part of your voters. Um, and these are the issues that are important to us. And, you know, those issues will be different for each community. Um, and Jack, I, I know that um, you encourage a lot of um, a, a lot of protection and advocacy agencies to do candidate forums. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about um, how those went and kind of what the what the purpose of those was. Yeah, at NDRN, we've been proud to encourage our um, affiliates in the protection and advocacy network to uh, engage with candidates through forums as a way to both educate them and the public. I'm proud to say they've been helping really lead the way there. And um, in fact, they help do forums in the Democrat in the um, mayoral election in New York City, including doing one uh, through the um, board, the nonpartisan board of elections for the uh, providing support for the Democratic primary. They've also did uh, forums in Albany, New York, and Buffalo, New York. Um, asking the candidates what they'll do uh, if elected for people with disabilities. And I'm proud to say that our South Carolina affiliate will be doing some forums as well in the uh, this fall in more rural counties, uh, trying to connect with voters with disabilities there who have often been underserved. As a uh, South Carolina born person, I am really glad to hear that. Um, so with that, we're going to close up this session. Thank you so much, Jack, um, for sharing this data and for sharing your perspective on the data as well. Um, so thank you so much. So next up, we are going to have a quick break from the live panel um, and presentation. So we're going to have two really important messages um, to watch from Wade Henderson the interim president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Leadership Conference Education Fund. 
I'm really excited for these messages um, that we will share now, and our next panel will begin at 3.15. Greetings. I'm Wade Henderson, Interim President and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. It's wonderful to be with you for this empowering Disability Vote Summit. We know that for our democracy to work for all of us, it must include us all. For too long, voters with disabilities have been overlooked and denied equal access to the ballot. But the truth is, voters with disabilities are in every state, every community, and every party. All of us have an obligation to make sure voters with disabilities can cast a ballot that counts. With more than 38 million eligible voters with disabilities, the disability community can make a tremendous difference and has done so across our nation's history. Disability rights are civil and human rights. We need the collective power of our coalition more than ever as state lawmakers turn their backs on voters and create egregious barriers to the ballot. This is our moment to act right now. We must urge Congress to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the For the People Act to ensure voting is safe and accessible for all and free from racial discrimination. This isn't a new fight, but it's a fight we've won before and together we'll win it again. Thank you. With those messages, I am beyond thrilled to introduce the next and last session of the summit. So our last session will be a panel that will focus on the future of the disability vote, asking what is our advocacy going to look like in the future and how can we best strategize to build the power of the disability vote. Our moderator will be Marlene Sayo, Executive Director of the Disability Law Center, Massachusetts's Protection and Advocacy Center and lead of RevUp Massachusetts. Joining Marlene are Cedric Lawson, Field Director at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Leadership Conference Education Fund, Teresa Moore, who serves as the Project Director for Two for Self Advocates for, sorry for Two Self Advocates Becoming Empowered Projects, the Save Go Voter Project, and Save's Self Advocacy Resource and Technical Assistance. And lastly, Galen Tootle. Among his roles, Galen is an independent living advocate at Walton Options, a center for independent living and co-chair of RevUp Georgia. Take it away, Marlene. Thank you very much, Lillian. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, excellent. Okay, um, so today uh, we're gonna cover the most important topic, at least as far as I'm concerned. It's about inclusion and advocacy. Um, I know that Lillian went ahead and she introduced, gave a little bio of everyone, but I'd like for everyone to just go around and I'll start first um, and provide your name and a short description about yourself. So my name is, as indicated, Marlene Salo. I'm with the Disability Law Center. I'm a Hispanic female with curly shoulder hair, uh, and I'm wearing a blouse that's blue with white circles on them, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, and I will tap Cedric. Thank you, Marlene. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cedric Lawson. I am a fair-skinned, light-skinned African-American man in his 30s. I am the field director of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, where I've had the opportunity to work with a number of disability rights advocates on the national level, as well as the state level, mainly in transportation equity, but also in other areas, including uh, fair courts advocacy and judicial nominations and voting rights. And passing it to Galen. Hey, thank you, Cedric. Uh, my name is Galen Tootle. I am, uh, as uh, Lillian said, independent living advocate here in uh, Augusta, Georgia, where I work for Walton Options, which is the Center for Independent Living. I am a black black male. Uh, my, my, my 
my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am a, I also serve on several uh, uh, disability uh, organizations and uh, 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 philanthropies, I guess is the word I want to use. I am the co-chair for Rev Up Georgia, as Lillian said. I'm also the first vice president of the National Federation of the Blind of Georgia. I serve on uh, two disability councils. One of them was uh, is the White House's uh, Office on uh, Public Engagement, in which Mr. Richmond serves. I serve on his Disability Council with Emily Vud, as well as Fair Fight, uh, Fair Fight Action's Disability Council. Uh, my focus is on uh, improving the lives of folk with disabilities through voter advocacy and any other advocacy because advocacy is my passion. I am a 61-year-old male who grew up in the rural South uh, who has seen this all before. And uh, again, this gift, that is the fire that, that, that burns in me because I'm not going back. Thank you. Thank you. And Teresa? Hello, my name is Teresa Moore. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona. And I am a white female with blonde hair. I wear glasses. And I have a background that says vote, vote the Save Go Voter Project, govoter.org. And my pronouns are she and her. Thank you, Teresa. So today, um, the summit so far has covered everything from the turnout habits of voters with disabilities to their political preferences and the barriers they face when trying to be a part of the electoral process. Um, but we also need to look about the advocacy piece um, both within the disability community and the broader civil rights community um, so that we can all work to achieve the progress that we need and so that we don't go back in time. So that progress, as we know, is a two-way street and those who decide the laws need to meet us halfway, which we're seeing in some states, they're not meeting us anywhere, right? They're basically trying to push us out. So my first question is for all of the panelists today. Um, and I would ask, uh, what is the one thing you wish today's attendees, um, especially lawmakers, knew about your community needs when it comes to being included in the political process? Um, and Teresa, may I start with you? Sure. One of the things that uh, works really well in the self-advocacy community and uh, for voters with disabilities is an invitation. An invitation to be included, to be invited, and to uh, welcome the ideas of the individual uh, representing maybe themselves and others if they have those kinds of connections and um, being respected for the ideas that they bring and being able to see those ideas implemented I think that that models for people with disabilities that you care about what they care about and that you do want to try to make improvements, um, especially with things like ballot access and um, accessibility at the polls and different things like that. I think that um, people with disabilities want to see what you are willing to do and will leave quickly if they don't see action and move to the next person who will take action. We are not going to spend a lot of time if our ideas are not respected. Thank you, Teresa. And Galen, what would you add? Um, wow, I could think of several things, but I yes, guess you can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll start with this one. Uh, and this is something that I, I constantly uh, stump for when I'm talking with, uh, I've spoken with the vice president before about this. I've spoken with uh, several of the disability uh, 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 rights organizations, as well as, as you were saying earlier, uh, the civil rights organizations. I think is that it is important that our message be more central in their messaging. In other words, a lot of times we hear about the black, the poor, the brown, and I'm all of that. And I'm also blind, I'm all of that. But I feel that uh, if we're going to win this fight and uh, we have no choice, we must win, uh, we're going to have to uh, implore them to put our messaging more central because what happens is if our message for disability 
and accessibility piece is more central to the messaging, I think we can probably get some more of those fringe supporters. Uh, a lot of supporters, you know, they support uh, the voter uh, 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 access process. They, they support fair voting, uh, but uh, sometimes you can beat them up too much if we just stay on the racial component now. I'm certainly about that because the racial component is real and it's serious. As I said, I grew up in rural Georgia and I know they'll pat you on the back and tell you everything is good. And yet at the same time, they're taking your water, won't let you eat, uh, won't even let you in their home because I grew up working for them. So I know how they think at least the people down here in Georgia. But I, if our messaging is more central, uh, I think we, we, we would have a better chance because uh, every question I get, when I'm in those in those spaces, especially the vice president, what well, Galen, what about coalition building? How is that going? Well, in Georgia, we do a great job, uh, but we got to do it uh, on a nationwide uh, uh, level. So my biggest uh, thing is I, I want our our plight to be more central to the messaging. And I think we could probably do a little better with getting some of those folk who are on the fence who may want to support voters uh, rights, but maybe kind of over here because we all know that racial uh, uh, issues in this country are at a, on a high level. So uh, anything we can do to uh, get our message in there, uh, we need to try to do that. And I think that is something that needs to be central to what we're doing moving forward. Thank you, Galen. And so listening to what Teresa and Galen said, Cedric, how would you incorporate that in your work and what else would you add to, to this conversation and the question posed? Absolutely. The very first thing I would uh, put forth is a call to action to everyone to, if you haven't, make sure that you have reached out to your federal decision makers, as well as your state uh, based decision makers, when it comes to, of course, on the federal level, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act and the For the People Act, and for the respective uh, voting rights activity that may be happening in your state. Of course, um, in over three dozen states, there has been voting rights uh, legislation introduced um, ever since the beginning of this year. Uh, so chances are there is voting rights legislation to engage your state uh, representatives on. And of course, there's that federal legislation. In addition, as advocates, uh, I want to uh, I want to uh, tag team with Galen on what he had mentioned in terms of intersecting identities. Uh, so many of us here in this space uh, are coming from a place of intersecting identities that are marginalized. And while we know that the root of so much of this uh, voter disenfranchisement is anti-Blackness, we have an opportunity in sharing with those uh, individuals in power from the perspective of, the per of a person with a disability, why this is so deeply important. In addition to that, Considering that there's so many identities that intersect with um, being a person with a disability, um, regardless of your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, uh, your, your income status, um, that gives the opportunity to work with people with disabilities across the, the spectrum and across coalition to understand that we can work together with people of faith, with people of color constituency groups, with environmental groups, understanding that our interests are all tied to keeping this democracy open for all. So in, so in addition to that call to action to, to those decision makers, I would also implore everyone to think about someone whom you haven't reached out to in your community that leads a constituency, whether they, they are a Jewish leader or they're from the uh, Islamic community, any faith leaders, any, uh, any youth or student groups, understanding that there are students with disabilities, there are people with faiths with disabilities, so that connection is already there. If you haven't yet reached out to someone who is not in your coalition or not a part of your work, reach out to them because inevitably there are, some, there are people with disabilities in their spaces. All right, because disability, it's an intersecting identity and it cuts across everything and, and some people, um, don't realize that. So it's up to us to educate them. And so along the lines of like tapping into the groups that are in our communities, um, you know, sometimes we need to understand that if we, we can't wait till the last minute, right? To reach out to groups, to start making that connection because it's about relationship building. 
It's about building that trust and that commonality in order for you to be stronger together, right? Because we're stronger together. And so along those lines, I, I just in watching some videos you have online, Galen, I know that you understand this concept very well. And so I was wondering if you could share with us, like, how does this ultimately work? on the ground in Georgia with all of the voter suppression actions that are taking place? And, and then how do we even apply that in Texas? If anyone has been on the ground in Texas doing the work, you know, it's uh, it's time for us to really band together. Um, yes. Well, I, I think uh, uh, you got to start early, as you said. Well, actually, over here in Georgia, we never stop. Uh, but we started out uh, last year, uh, last year voter dis disability voter registration uh, week, and uh, we began uh, uh, to getting out the registering folk to vote. Uh, then we started planning for uh, the the upcoming election. Uh, we were very fortunate enough to uh, link up with a young lady who uh, 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 was helping our co-chair. Come up, uh, support a what we call a grassroots connectors program. Georgia basically is a rural state. We have maybe four uh, metropolitan cities in the state. So what we found uh, uh, out that we needed to get boots on the grounds in the country. Uh, and again, me being from the country uh, uh, and uh, understanding a lot of how that thing works down there, we were able to put together a, a network of young folk uh, and uh, older folk like me through uh, what we call our grassroots connectors, our grassroots connectors Gen Z program. And we had people going out into these rural communities. They start, we did phone banks, we did uh, uh, personal in, in person events. Uh, we, we did whatever it required uh, to reach the people and understanding that in most cases it's grassroots. We believe in that approach because. Uh, that's how we get our people. We don't have very uh, good transportation networks here. So we linked up also with local uh, churches, faith-based organizations. Uh, we, put boot, uh, we put drivers out there. We, we provided them with stipends to uh, go and pick up the people. And uh, we did not stop. Uh, we continue to do that throughout the uh, general election and uh, the uh, special election, which was held in January. So we know that through grassroots connecting, uh, getting young people involved, uh, getting your faith-based uh, organizations involved. Uh, and again, we reach out also to, we work with uh, Black Voters Matter. Uh, we work with uh, the New Georgia Project. We, we work with All Voting is Local. In other words, uh, anybody was out there doing the type of work that we're doing as it relates to getting our folk into place so that they can exercise their right to vote securely, freely, and uh, accessibly, uh, we would talk to them. We would work with them. And uh, again, that is a, that's what's really important uh, as we move forward because Texas uh, basically is seeing some of the same stuff that we're seeing. And it's obvious they, uh, you know, one thing I would like to say about that, though, is that uh, while while a lot of this, these vote the language in these voting bills uh, seems to be the same, so it looks like there were a bunch of ghostwriters writing that stuff. So it is a combined effort on their part. So it has to be a combined effort on our part, and with the understanding that we we we're, we're simply just not going to go back. And that requires the mentality that I have as an advocate, having uh, grown, grown up in the 60s. And like I said, I've seen all this stuff before. It's nothing new. Uh, uh, I'm going to die on my feet to live on my knees. So with that being my mantra, we push for the change. And we understand that all hands on deck. And that is the mentality that I feel is the best way to approach uh, dealing with these folks with the understanding that you're not dealing with the people that we used to deal with. The legislators are not the same. All of this voter integrity stuff was all built on a lie. So the warm and fuzzy milk toast approach may work, but you have to be willing to go a little further because we got to get our people registered to vote. Here in Georgia, we're the most disenfranchised group of voters in this state, the blind voter. We can't read our ballot. We can't review our ballots. And that's a non-start. ADA says we should have that right. So I don't want to take up too much, but you're, no, you're, no. But you have to be, you have to be willing to press and have to understand the, the environment in which you're working. These people don't, these people really don't care uh, because if they did, they wouldn't tell you that you can't have water or a snack uh, on a July day in the state of Georgia down south when it's 90 something degrees. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Teresa, along the same lines, I know that you are part of the SAVE project, which I have been working with for the past three and a half years, and, and you yourself have been on the ground trying to get the vote out um, and um, representing, uh, you know, the, the need and the right to be able to vote independently um, and privately. And so I would love to hear from you uh, what it is that you do uh, yourself along with other state members to make sure that people with disabilities know what their, vote, their rights are when it comes to uh, voting at the polls. Well, one of the things that we do and that we spend a great deal of time on is making sure that individuals know that our training is available to them. A lot of uh, voters, when we first started the project and it continues today, say that they don't really understand how it all works and they don't have a connection with voting. It's not natural for some people to do that. Um, because they've had so many decisions taken away in their life um, and have other people that may be in charge of their life in guardianship and other things. And having the opportunity to learn what it's like to have uh, this power to make a change that could make things better for people is sometimes a new concept to people. So building the confidence of people in their abilities to make good decisions uh, for themselves and about their lives is the place that we start. The personal story is, is always a great beginning point for a lot of people. What are the issues that they're having in their everyday life and, and starting from there because they may not draw those natural connections that people who live this every day uh, get. And so helping them to connect to the points and to the legislators based on what interests the legislators and the issues that they're working on, thinking about things like uh, climate change and things like that for people's health. You know, sometimes it's not a natural draw to make those connections. So helping people understand that it really is your issue to think about some of these things and helping people put their connection and their personal story in, into it. And then finding help or mentoring uh, for them to um, get help with their issues. Uh, we make lots of connections. We know lots of people in our lives but how have we built connections with people and made really powerful introductions so that people could build those skills that they need to start to speak up and, and have somebody that's really gonna listen to them and um, care about what they care about and then take it to the next level where they actually see something that they wanted change uh, take it through the voting process, uh, help uh, people understand what it are in bills. Um, and uh, we like to do really great um, information sheets that are in plain language, um, trying to reach as many people as possible with and without disabilities who don't understand the voting process and what the issues truly are and breaking it down into how this affects your daily life. This, this bill will change your life if it goes this way or that way and how that would, how that would affect you. Um, we've been able to successfully do that for a number of years and help voters and their supporters and those who question whether they really understand it. Um, you know, being able to listen to a person in a training talk about, you know, how important it is for them to vote and the issue that's important to them. Some of the supporters are their staff and their family members, and they get to listen to individuals speak up for the first time about what's important to them and giving them that safe place to do that where we can facilitate the conversation and help people talk about what's going on in their lives and make that connection. 
and we do that. It's kind of like a one person at a time approach, but also a movement at a time approach, because as people see each other and model for each other how that is done, we gain power and control over our lives. I like that it's one member at a time approach, but it's also a movement approach. That's I love that. And and have you found from your own personal experience that this this approach has actually helped to um, inform uh, elected officials so that they can start being a bit more inclusive when it comes to people with disabilities or with developmental disabilities, to be exact. Well, I've, I've listened to some self-advocates that have gotten totally involved in politics and really have found their niche, as they say, to, to get involved and have a connection. Um, relationships that are built on a forum of trust and respect are always powerful and they have a tendency to last for a really long time. And we do want to be that trusted person that can say to them, this is my issue, or this may not be my issue, but I know how to connect you to people that this is their issue, who can help us talk about this in a completely open environment with uh, full hearts going forward and, and making change and, and giving good ideas that you know, have been well thought out and um, just having us involved in their lives changes the way that they look at things, how they start to question and look at their community and say, that's not really accessible. How can I improve that? Starting looking at the neighborhood level and putting uh, dollars in places like curb cuts and different things that neighborhoods need to, to invite people to participate and uh, be more open to them. I think that's one of the biggest ways that people with disabilities, when we build a personal relationship, we are great influencers and we may not even realize it, but that's what's so great about it is that we don't have to have the credit to get the work done. Oh, love it. Thank you so much. And Cedric, I'm out because I don't want to leave you out of this, right? Because you've done some fabulous work as an activist. You're fighting for transportation equity, you know, and you've done that both within the disability community and part of the broader civil rights movement and communities. And we all know disability rights, civil rights, civil right? rights. Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so what are some of the successes that you have had, right? And how do you think that what you've learned from those fights can now be transferred and applied um, for the ongoing fight for political inclusion of all people with disabilities. Absolutely. I, I go back to coalition in that we have to work together in order to achieve these victories. Uh, we are in a place in the 21st century in the United States that no one constituency alone uh, can win on a political battle. So whether it is for um, voting rights, or whether it's for a fair and accurate count of the census, and that, of course, is still ongoing in terms of uh, political representation and the like, uh, whether it comes to big democracy-based issues like those, whether it comes to justice and policing activity, which, of course, we're fighting for on the Hill, uh, whether it comes to environmental activity. Naturally, people with disabilities are impacted by all of these pieces. However, it's our necessity to work together to advance these agenda items for civil and human rights. Therefore, when people of disability, people with disabilities are at the table, I encourage you all to ensure that all ways to maintain accessibility for these activities of the democracy, whether it's voting, whether it is engaging in the census, whether it is, um, whether it is engaging in um, the ability to secure uh, economic security um, through the pandemic and otherwise, ensuring that you all are always at the table in these conversations is much like the curb cuts piece that Teresa just brought up, which is that what is helpful for people with disabilities um, as a constituency is helpful for all of us in society. 
And we know that at the leadership conference, which is why we work to ensure that people with disabilities are constantly involved in our task force activities and activities, for example, uh, like we were talking about today with voting rights. So in coalition, there is strength and we cannot win without coalition. And finally, to have a friend, you gotta be a friend. So there are three uh, points that I wanna impart in terms of what is so important about coalition. In coalition, there is strength, as I mentioned, in this time, we can't win alone. Um, uh, we can't do it without coalition at this point. And finally, to have a friend, you gotta be a friend. So what does it mean for us to consistently engage each other on our own self-interest, things that are important to us in terms of ensuring that we have the opportunity to participate broadly uh, in activities throughout our, our, uh, our communities and within our country, but then also understanding how we can be helpful to others in, um, in struggles that they are moving on. So not just, of course, in voting rights and other activities related to democracy, but then also broadly within civil and human rights, whether it comes to justice and policing or education equity, or ensuring that there is access to resources throughout this pandemic. Thank you so very much, Cedric. I appreciate that. And Galen, I'm gonna give you the last question because we got five minutes here, right? Um, okay. But I, I, wanted, I really wanna hear from you. So, you know, today we've heard about the, uh, some of the barriers um, that blind voters face when casting their ballots. We know that's an ongoing issue here in Massachusetts. Uh, we've actually been able to get accessible uh, voting um, from home. Um, and the city of Boston, we just got a settlement agreement this week. Wow. Uh, so uh, the city of Boston is allowing uh, voters to vote from home and, and electronically with accessible ballots. So we're, we're working on it. Um, but Barriers exist in all aspects of our life, right? Including advocacy itself. And so how do you think activists uh, within the disability movement can be more inclusive of individuals with visual impairments who, or who are blind? Because we see it all around us that yeah. sometimes it's an afterthought. Yeah, well, well first of all, uh, Title II says that uh, we all should have public access to it. So it's already the law. Of course, mm -hmm. now it's within the ADA, which is, you know, you know what that is. It's, it, it says it's, it's, it, get, it puts a little template there, but you still have to work it. But it says that we, as uh, all public, act, uh, public activities or public entities, have to be accessible to all folk. So as I told the vice president, when she asked me, and I keep, I'm sorry, I have to hard back, but she asked me if there was one thing that she could do right now, what would that be? And what I told her was it would, it, it would be to bring in the Department of Justice because uh, for us not to be able to uh, review our ballot to ensure that it printed exactly what we asked it to print, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a breach of the law. So. And it's on the book. So the Justice Department should come down to Georgia and do whatever they do, i.e. file a lawsuit uh, and say, you know, that's illegal. Now, we do have the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center. We're, we're partnered up with them. Uh, they're doing some things down here in Georgia. But uh, it's just simply, uh, that is why I have the mentality that I have. And that is, you guys know this is the law. Uh, and this isn't new because uh, we talked about this last year. So uh, I just want folk to basically do what the law says. Uh, let's work together and get this done because this is the law. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know at this point because uh, having pushed back against these guys for so long down here, that it's just simply a matter of probably going to require, uh, you know, uh, uh, judicial action because. They simply don't want to do it. So what we need for everybody to do is understand that we're in it together, nothing for us without us, and that if uh, one uh, section of the community is being discriminated against, then all of us are. And if that is what we're here to do uh, to improve the lives of folk with disabilities, then uh, I, I, we implore you to get out there with us and just uh, make sure that they enforce the ADA, Title II. Uh, that's a simple fix. It's the law. 
And uh, if we do it, uh, as Cedric said, uh, in mass as a group, uh, we can get it done. Uh, and while we're looking at that, uh, I just saw where we're going to do a briefing tonight about the American uh, Freedom Vote Act, which was just dropped in the Senate today. Uh, it's important that uh, we get out and fight for that, because if we reach out to our legislators and let them know, hey, you need to pass this bill in the Senate, uh, then that would, that would really get rid of a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the unfair practices, i.e. the uh, keeping folk from being able to vote. The, you know, it, this, would, this would save us a lot of grief. So get in touch with your legislators, uh, speak to them uh, frankly, uh, and encourage them to uh, encourage everyone who has uh, a stake in this to uh, get out there so that we can uh, uh, improve our opportunities to vote because uh, we're voting is uh, we need to work on this thing because for people like me and mine, uh, which is uh, black, brown, disabled folk here in the state of Georgia, our lives do depend on it, the fact that we could we need to be able to vote freely, fairly and securely. Thank you so very much. And may I just be a little rebel rouser and say, if you're gonna go vote, why don't you just ask for the accommodation in writing? Reach out to the secretary's office and say, I need an accommodation, this is what I need. We actually have sample language on the Massachusetts PNA mm -hmm. website and mm -hmm. start bombarding them to see if it makes them wake up and start making some changes at the state level also with their legislation. And this is why I have to say that, and that's why I was speaking about the mentality go, because see, that's not new. I spoke with Secretary Roethlisberger here on many occasions, and I told him uh, that it would not work uh, because they did come up with a Band-Aid uh, for the blind voter where they would allow them to bring in their devices. Well, most blind people, especially our seniors and a lot of folks, they don't have that technology, so they're not going to be able to. And I told him it would, it would not work. So uh, I've spoken to Roethlisberger on many occasions. Uh, believe me, uh, but all hands on deck, and I would love to get uh, that, some of that uh, language that you got, the verbiage that you all have, so that we can incorporate that into our movement. Because again, it's all about registering folk, educating folk, and you, giving them the power to you, giving them the information that they need so that they can use their power. So we thank you for that, and uh, we're looking for all and any help that we can get. Sounds great. Thank you very much, everyone. And we've reached our mark of three or well over the mark of 351 i want to thank cedric Teresa, and galen today for such a fabulous discussion i wish we could have gone on for at least another half hour so uh once again thank you everyone for attending thank today's you. conference Thanks so much to all of you. I agree that I could have I could have watched y'all have this conversation for a lot longer. Um, so thank you all. Um, one of the things I really this is Lillian, by the way. One of the things that I really appreciated from the last um, conversation was the focus on working in coalition with different communities, different faith communities, different communities of color. Um, and as Cedric said, we cannot win without coalition. Um, and that's definitely, a, a, I think it's been a foundation um, and should be a foundation of our work. Um, so thank you so much to every single speaker, panelist, everyone who worked together to make this event happen. Um, thank you so much to all of the attendees um, here today um, who have spent part of your day with us. Um, I hope that you are going to end this summit with some new um, thoughts and perspectives and an inspiration on getting out the disability vote and making sure that disabled voters have full and equal access to the ballot. Um, and the conversation started today will hopefully be ones that continue um, throughout the coming uh, months and the coming year. Um, as a reminder, this summit is recorded, so the slides and transcript and recording will be available after. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, um, this week is National Disability Voter Registration Week, and so you can check out all of the other events taking place um, at uh, a website I'm going to post in the chat, www.aapd.com backslash ndvrw. Also a quick plug, if you are in California, make sure to cast your ballot um, in the recall election that um, ends today at 8 p.m. local time. 
Um, so make sure that you get your ballot in. Um, and then I'm really excited for this last part of today's um, summit to close out our Disability Vote Summit and send us off into our communities. I'm going to hand it over to my boss, Maria Town, um, CEO and President of the American Association of People with Disabilities. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, I have a lot of thank yous to say, but before I get into those, I'm going to uh, describe myself. This is Maria Town, President and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities Speaking. I am a white woman with shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing red lipstick and a red dress. Um, and I have a background behind me that's of hands, uh, black hands holding up protest signs that say, vote like your life depends on it because it does. And that is a quote from Justin Dart, um, the grandfather of the ADA and founder of AAPD. Um, so let me get back to these really important thank yous. Uh, thank you to everyone who has been a part of this summit. And I wanna especially thank Lillian Aluri and Jack Rosen who have really led in the organization and planning efforts. Thank you so much to our panelists and presenters for sharing your experience and insights with us and for really setting a vision for how we can continue to build the power of the disability vote. In 2022, when we look at new uh, disability voter turnout data, I want that 7% gap um, close closed. Um, and I'm sure that after this summit um, that we can actually achieve that goal. Thank you to all of the organizers who are out there and a part of National Disability Voter Registration Week and engaging with their communities to get people registered um, and to get people to turn out. We have over 100 events planned um, during this week across the country for National Disability Voter Registration Week. Um, I wanna say thank you to the National Disability Rights Network, for, particularly for co-hosting this event with us and for helping to make the whole event possible. Um, we ended this discussion um, or today's summit with a discussion of what we need to do in the future to ensure that we can continue to advance enfranchisement, to ensure that we don't go backward, which after hearing um, all of the data from today, we know is all too close at hand. We are uh, risking, we are, everything is so fragile in our democracy. Um, and as advocates, we're, we're always looking back at what we've learned and we're looking ahead for further accomplishments and to the next goalpost. Um, but I'm, I am preaching and singing to the choir here today on this summit because I know that none of our other goals will be possible. Our goals around healthcare, around transportation, around education, around employment will be possible if we don't do everything we can to protect and defend and advance our right to vote. I'm gonna hearken back to Galen. Uh, you know, we're not gonna maintain our democracy through being nice. Uh, we've got to fight and the time to fight is now. At the federal level for the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, at the state level to prevent um, all of these voter suppression bills that have, um, are, are getting passed left and right. And even uh, at federal legislation that doesn't explicitly focus on voting rights. Today, we heard quite a bit about the digital divide and how that limits people's abilities to make informed decisions and their abilities to cast their ballots. We didn't hear as much about things like physical infrastructure that often preclude people from getting to the polls, but there's a giant infrastructure package going through Congress right now, and it includes a subsidy for broadband internet. It includes a mandate to make all legacy transit systems accessible. And in addition to passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, Congress needs to pass that infrastructure bill because our civil rights, our civic engagement depend on it. One of the reasons I put that uh, Justin Dart quote in my background, vote like your life depends on it because it does, is because I am acknowledging the present moment. We are still in a global pandemic one that has drastically impacted disabled people, particularly disabled people of color. In the past year and a half, we have had to say over and over and over again that our lives deserve to be protected and that we deserve to be saved as states have said that 
disabled people don't deserve critical medical resources. Voting is a way that we as the disability community, a community that is too often silenced and shunned into the shadows, voting is a way that we say we are here. We deserve to be here and we deserve to live in a world that works for us and with us. Voting is the way that we self-direct our own lives and have a say in so many of the things that are important to us. It is the way that we shape our future. And so with that, again, I want to say thank you. And I want to encourage all of you to dream and work towards a future where disabled people of color, LGBTQIA plus people, two-spirit organizers, and people across the broad spectrum of disability can live and work in a nation that allows them to thrive and fully allows their voice to be heard in every aspect of life. So with that, uh, it's right at four o'clock. Uh, again, thank you to everyone. We're going to continue to work together to build the power of the disability vote, and we're gonna vote like our life depends on it because it does. This is both a marathon and a sprint, um, and we are going to change the shape of our nation as we run towards the finish line. Thank you so much.